Section 1 of The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. March 12, 1933. My friends, I want to talk for a few minutes with the people of the United States about banking, to talk with the comparatively few who understand the mechanics of banking, but more particularly with the overwhelming majority of you who use banks for the making of deposits and the drawing of checks. I want to tell you what has been done in the last few days, and why it was done, and what the next steps are going to be. I recognize that the many proclamations from the state capitals and from Washington, the legislation, the treasury regulations, and so forth, couched for the most part in banking and legal terms, ought to be explained for the benefit of the average citizen. I owe this, in particular because of the fortitude and the good temper with which everybody has accepted the inconvenience and the hardships of the banking holiday. I know that when you understand what we in Washington have been about, I shall continue to have your cooperation, as fully as I have had your sympathy and your help during the past week. First of all, let me state the simple fact that when you deposit money in a bank, the bank does not put the money into a safe deposit vault. It invests your money in many different forms of credit, in bonds, in commercial paper, in mortgages, and in many other kinds of loans. In other words, the bank puts your money to work to keep the wheels of industry and of agriculture turning round. A comparatively small part of the money that you put into the bank is kept in currency, an amount which in normal times is wholly sufficient to cover the cash needs of the average citizen. In other words, the total amount of all the currency in the country is only a comparatively small proportion of the total deposits in all the banks of the country. What, then, happened during the last few days of February and the first few days of March? Because of undermined confidence on the part of the public, there was a general rush, by a large portion of our population, to turn bank deposits into currency or gold, a rush so great that the soundest banks couldn't get enough currency to meet the demand. The reason for this was that on the spur of the moment it was, of course, impossible to sell perfectly sound assets of a bank and convert them into cash, except at panic prices far below their real value. By the afternoon of March 3rd, a week ago last Friday, scarcely a bank in the country was open to do business. Proclamations closing them, in whole or in part, had been issued by the governors in almost all of the states. It was then that I issued the proclamation providing for the national bank holiday, and this was the first step in the government's reconstruction of our financial and economic fabric. The second step, last Thursday, was the legislation, promptly and patriotically passed by the Congress, confirming my proclamation and broadening my powers so that it became possible, in view of the requirement of time, to extend the holiday and lift the ban of that holiday gradually in the days to come. This law also gave authority to develop a program of rehabilitation of our banking facilities, and I want to tell our citizens in every part of the nation that the National Congress, Republicans and Democrats alike, showed by this action a devotion to the public welfare and a realization of the emergency and the necessity for speed that it is difficult to match in all of our history. The third stage has been the series of regulations permitting the banks to continue their functions, to take care of the distribution of food and household necessities and the payment of payrolls. This bank holiday, while resulting in many cases in great inconvenience, is affording us the opportunity to supply the currency necessary to meet the situation. Remember that no sound bank is a dollar worse off than it was when it closed its doors last week. Neither is any bank which may turn out not to be in a position for immediate opening. The new law allows the twelve Federal Reserve banks to issue additional currency on good assets, and thus banks that reopen will be able to meet every legitimate call. 
the new currency is being sent out by the bureau of engraving and printing in large volume to every part of the country it is sound currency because it is backed by actual good assets another question that you will ask is this why are all the banks not to be reopened at the same time the answer is simple and i know you will understand it your government does not intend that the history of the past few years shall be repeated we do not want and will not have another epidemic of bank failures as a result we start tomorrow monday with the opening of banks in the twelve federal reserve bank cities those banks which on first examination by the treasury have already been found to be all right that will be followed on tuesday by the resumption of all other functions by banks already found to be sound in cities where there are recognized clearing houses that means about two hundred and fifty cities of the united states in other words we are moving as fast as the mechanics of the situation will allow us on wednesday and succeeding days banks in smaller places all through the country will resume business subject of course to the government's physical ability to complete its survey it is necessary that the reopening of banks be extended over a period in order to permit the banks to make applications for the necessary loans to obtain currency needed to meet their requirements and to enable the government to make common sense checkups please let me make it clear to you that if your bank does not open the first day you are by no means justified in believing that it will not open a bank that opens on one of the subsequent days is in exactly the same status as the bank that opens tomorrow i know that many people are worrying about state banks that are not members of the federal reserve system there is no occasion for that worry these banks can and will receive assistance from member banks and from the reconstruction finance corporation and of course they are under the immediate control of the state banking authorities these state banks are following the same course as the national banks except that they get their licenses to resume business from the state authorities and these authorities have been asked by the secretary of the treasury to permit their good banks to open up on the same schedule as the national banks so i am confident that the state banking departments will be as careful as the national government in the policy relating to the opening of banks and will follow the same broad theory it is possible that when the banks resume a very few people who have not recovered from their fear may again begin withdrawals let me make it clear to you that the banks will take care of all needs except of course the hysterical demands of hoarders and it is my belief that hoarding during the past week has become an exceedingly unfashionable pastime in every part of our nation it needs no profit to tell you that when the people find that they can get their money that they can get it when they want it for all legitimate purposes the phantom of fear will soon be laid people will again be glad to have their money where it will be safely taken care of and where they can use it conveniently at any time i can assure you my friends that it is safer to keep your money in a reopened bank than it is to keep it under the mattress the success of our whole national program depends of course on the cooperation of the public on its intelligent support and its use of a reliable system remember that the essential accomplishment of the new legislation is that it makes it possible for banks more readily to convert their assets into cash than was the case before more liberal provision has been made for banks to borrow on these assets at the reserve banks and more liberal provision has also been made for issuing currency on the security of these good assets this currency is not fiat currency it is issued only on adequate security and every good bank has an abundance of such security one more point before i close there will be of course some banks unable to reopen without being reorganized the new law allows the government to assist in making these reorganizations quickly and effectively and even allows the government to subscribe to at least a part of any new capital that may be required i hope you can see my friends from this essential recital of what your government is doing that there is nothing complex nothing radical in the process we had a bad banking situation some of our bankers had shown themselves either incompetent or dishonest in their handling of the people's funds 
they had used the money entrusted to them in speculations and unwise loans. This was, of course, not true of the vast majority of our banks, but it was true in enough of them to shock the people of the United States for a time into a sense of insecurity, and to put them into a frame of mind where they did not differentiate, but seemed to assume that the acts of a comparative few had tainted them all. And so it became the government's job to straighten out this situation, and to do it as quickly as possible, and that job is being performed. I do not promise you that every bank will be reopened, or that individual losses will not be suffered, but there will be no losses that possibly could be avoided, and there would have been more and greater losses had we continued to drift. I can even promise you salvation for some, at least, of the sorely pressed banks. We shall be engaged not merely in reopening sound banks, but in the creation of more sound banks through reorganization. It has been wonderful to me to catch the note of confidence from all over the country. I can never be sufficiently grateful to the people for the loyal support they have given me in their acceptance of the judgment that has dictated our course, even though all the processes may not have seemed clear to them. After all, there is an element in the readjustment of our financial system more important than currency, more important than gold, and that is the confidence of the people themselves. Confidence and courage are the essentials of success in carrying out our plan. You, people, must have faith. You must not be stampeded by rumors or guesses. Let us unite in banishing fear. We have provided the machinery to restore our financial system, and it is up to you to support and make it work. It is your problem, my friends, your problem no less than it is mine. Together, we cannot fail. End of section one. Recording by Maria Casper. Section two of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. May seventh, nineteen thirty three. On a Sunday night, a week after my inauguration, I used the radio to tell you about the banking crisis, and about the measures we were taking to meet it. In that way I tried to make clear to the country various facts that might otherwise have been misunderstood, and in general to provide a means of understanding which I believe did much to restore confidence. Tonight, eight weeks later, I come for the second time to give you my report, in the same spirit and by the same means to tell you about what we have been doing and what we are planning to do. Two months ago, as you know, we were facing serious problems. The country was dying by inches. It was dying because trade and commerce had declined to dangerously low levels. Prices for basic commodities were such as to destroy the value of the assets of national institutions such as banks and savings banks and insurance companies and others. These institutions, because of their great needs, were foreclosing mortgages, they were calling loans, and they were refusing credit. Thus there was actually in process of destruction the property of millions of people who had borrowed money on that property, in terms of dollars which had an entirely different value from the level of March 1933. The situation in that crisis did not call for any complicated consideration of economic panaceas or fancy plans. We were faced by a condition, and not a theory. There were just two alternatives at that time. The first was to allow the foreclosures to continue, credit to be withheld, money to go into hiding, thus forcing liquidation and bankruptcy of banks and railroads and insurance companies, and a recapitalizing of all business and all property on a lower level. That alternative meant a continuation of what is loosely called deflation, the net result of which would have been extraordinary hardships on all property owners and all bank depositors, 
and, incidentally, extraordinary hardships on all persons working for wages through an increase in unemployment and a further reduction of the wage scale. It is easy to see that the result of that course would have not only economic effects of a very serious nature, but social results also that might bring incalculable harm. Even before I was inaugurated, I came to the conclusion that such a policy was too much to ask the American people to bear. It involved not only a further loss of homes and farms and savings and wages, but also a loss of spiritual values, the loss of that sense of security for the present and the future that is so necessary to the peace and contentment of the individual and of his family. When you destroy those things, you find it difficult to establish confidence of any sort in the future. And it is clear that mere appeals coming out of Washington for more confidence and the mere lending of more money to shaky institutions could not stop that downward course. A prompt program, applied as quickly as possible, seemed to me not only justified but imperative to our national security. The Congress— and when I say the Congress, I mean the members of both political parties, fully understood this, and gave me generous and intelligent support. The members of the Congress realized that the methods of normal times had to be replaced in the emergency by measures that were suited to the serious and pressing requirements of the moment. There was no actual surrender of power. Congress still retains its constitutional authority to legislate and to appropriate, and no one has the slightest desire to change the balance of these powers. The function of Congress is to decide what has to be done, and to select the appropriate agency to carry out its will. That policy it has strictly adhered to. The only thing that has been happening has been to designate the President of the United States as the agency to carry out certain of the purposes of the Congress. This was constitutional, and is constitutional, and it is in keeping with the past American tradition. The legislation that has been passed, or is in the process of enactment, can properly be considered as part of a well-grounded, well-rounded plan. First, we are giving opportunity of employment to a quarter of a million of the unemployed, especially the young men who have dependents, to let them go into forestry and flood prevention work. That is a big task, because it means feeding and clothing and caring for nearly twice as many men as we have in the regular army itself. And in creating this Civilian Conservation Corps, we are killing two birds with one stone. We are clearly enhancing the value of our natural resources, and at the same time we are relieving an appreciable amount of actual distress. This great group of men, young men, have entered upon their work on a purely voluntary basis. No military training is involved. And we are conserving not only our natural resources, but also our human resources. One of the great values to this work is the fact that it is direct and requires the intervention of very little machinery. Secondly, I have requested the Congress, and have secured action, upon a proposal to put the great properties owned by our government at Muscle Shoals to work after long years of wasteful inaction, and with this goes hand in hand a broad plan for the permanent improvement of the vast area included in the whole of the Tennessee Valley. It will add to the comfort and to the happiness of hundreds of thousands of people and the incident benefits will reach the entire nation. Next, the Congress is about to pass legislation that will greatly ease the mortgage distress among the farmers and among the homeowners of the nation, by providing for the easing of the burden of debt that now bears so heavily upon millions of our people. The next step in seeking immediate relief is a grant of half a billion dollars to help the states and the counties and the municipalities in their duty to care for those who at this time need direct and immediate relief. In addition to all this, the Congress also passed legislation, as you know, authorizing the sale of beer in such states as desire it. That has already resulted in considerable re-employment, and incidentally it has provided for the federal government and for the states a much-needed tax revenue. Now, as to the future. 
we are planning within a few days to ask the congress for legislation to enable the government to undertake public works thus stimulating directly and indirectly the employment of many others in well-considered projects further legislation has been taken up which goes much more fundamentally into our economic problems the farm relief bill seeks by the use of several methods alone or together to bring about an increased return to farmers for their major farm products seeking at the same time to prevent in the days to come disastrous overproduction the kind of overproduction that so often in the past has kept farm commodity prices far below a reasonable return this measure provides wide powers for emergencies and the extent of its use will depend entirely upon what the future has in store well considered and conservative measures will likewise be proposed within a few days that will attempt to give to the industrial workers of the country a more fair wage return to prevent cutthroat competition to prevent unduly long hours for labor and at the same time to encourage each industry to prevent overproduction one of our bills falls into the same class the railroad bill it seeks to provide and make certain a definite planning by the railroads themselves with the assistance of the government in order to eliminate the duplication and the waste that now results in railroad receiverships and in continuing operating deficits i feel very certain that the people of this country understand and approve the broad purposes behind these new governmental policies relating to agriculture and industry and transportation we found ourselves faced with more agricultural products than we could possibly consume ourselves and with surpluses which other nations did not have the cash to buy from us except at prices ruinously low we found our factories able to turn out more goods than we could possibly consume and at the same time we have been faced with a falling export demand we have found ourselves with more facilities to transport goods and crops than there were goods and crops to be transported all of this has been caused in large part by a complete lack of planning and a complete failure to understand the danger signals that have been flying ever since the close of the world war the people of this country have been erroneously encouraged to believe that they could keep on increasing the output of farm and of factory indefinitely and that some magician would find ways and means for that increased output to be consumed with a reasonable profit to the producer but today we have reason to believe that things are a little better than they were two months ago industry has picked up railroads are carrying more freight farm prices are better but i am not going to indulge in issuing proclamations of over-enthusiastic assurance we cannot ballyhoo ourselves back to prosperity and i am going to be honest at all times with the people of the country i do not want the people of this country to take the foolish course of letting this improvement come back on another speculative wave i do not want the people to believe that because of unjustified optimism we can resume the ruinous practice of increasing our crop output and our factory output in the hope that a kind providence will find buyers at high prices such a course may bring us immediate and false prosperity but it will be the kind of prosperity that will lead us into another tailspin it is wholly wrong to call the measures that we have taken government control of farming or government control of industry or government control of transportation it is rather a partnership a partnership between government and farming a partnership between government and industry and a partnership between government and transportation not a partnership in profits because the profits will still go to the private citizen but rather a partnership in planning and a partnership to see that the plans are carried out let me illustrate with an example take for instance the cotton goods industry it is probably true that ninety per cent of the cotton manufacturers of this country would agree tomorrow to eliminate starvation wages would agree to stop long hours of employment would agree to stop child labor would agree to prevent overproduction that would result in unsaleable surpluses but my friends what good is such an agreement of the ninety per cent 
if the other ten per cent of the cotton manufacturers pay starvation wages and require long hours and employ children in their mills and turn out burdensome surpluses that unfair ten per cent could produce goods so cheaply that the fair ninety per cent would be compelled to meet the same unfair conditions and that is where government comes in government ought to have the right and will have the right after surveying and planning for an industry to prevent with the assistance of the overwhelming majority in that industry all unfair practices and to enforce that agreement by the authority of government the so-called antitrust laws were intended to prevent the creation of monopolies and to forbid unreasonable profits to those monopolies the purpose of the antitrust laws must be continued but those laws were never intended to encourage the kind of unfair competition that results in long hours and starvation wages and overproduction and my friends the same principle that is illustrated by this example applies to farm products and to transportation and to every other field of organized private industry we are working towards a definite goal a goal that seeks to prevent the return to conditions which came very close to destroying what we alive call modern civilization the actual accomplishment of our purposes cannot be attained in a day our policies are wholly within the purposes for which our american constitutional government was established one hundred fifty years ago i know that the people of this country will understand this and that they will also understand the spirit in which we are undertaking that policy i do not deny that we may make some mistakes of procedure as we carry out this policy i have no expectation of making a hit every time i come to bat what i seek is the highest possible batting average not only for myself but for the team theodore roosevelt once said to me if i can be right seventy-five per cent of the time i shall come up to the fullest measure of my hopes much has been said of late about federal finances and inflation about the gold standard and francs and pounds and so forth i should like to make the facts very simple and to make my policy very clear in the first place government credit and government currency are really one and the same thing behind government bonds there is a promise to pay behind government currency we have in addition to the promise to pay a reserve of gold and a small reserve of silver neither of them anything like the total amount of the currency and in this connection it is worth while remembering that in the past the government has agreed to redeem nearly thirty billions of its debts and its currency in gold and private corporations and individuals in this country have agreed to redeem another sixty or seventy billions of securities and mortgages in gold the government and the private corporations and the individuals were making these agreements when they knew full well that all of the gold in the united states amounted to only between three and four billion and that all of the gold in all of the world amounted to only about eleven billion if the holders of these promises to pay were all of them to start in to demand gold the first comers would get gold for a few days or a few hours and those first comers who would get the gold would amount to about one twenty-fifth of all the holders of the securities and the currency the other twenty-four people out of twenty-five who did not happen to be at the top of the line would be politely told that there was no more gold left and so we have decided in washington to treat all twenty-five people in the same way in the interest of justice and in the exercise of the constitutional powers of this government we placed everyone on the same basis in order that the general good may be preserved nevertheless gold and to a partial extent silver also are perfectly good bases for currency and that is why i decided not to let any of the gold now in the country go out of it a series of conditions arose three weeks ago which very readily might have meant first a drain on our gold by foreign countries and secondly as a result of that drain a flight of american capital itself in the form of gold out of our country and it is not exaggerating the possibility to tell you that such an occurrence might well have taken from us the major part of our gold reserve and might well have resulted in such a further weakening of our government and private credit 
as to bring on actual panic conditions and the complete stoppage of the wheels of industry. The administration has the definite objective of raising commodity prices to such an extent that those who have borrowed money will on average be able to repay that money in the same kind of dollar which they borrowed. We do not seek to let them get such a cheap dollar that in effect they will be able to pay back a great deal less than they borrowed. In other words, we seek to correct a wrong and not to create another wrong in the opposite direction. That is why powers are being given to the administration to provide, if necessary, for an enlargement of credit in order to correct the existing wrong. These powers will be used when, as, and if they may be necessary to accomplish the purpose. Hand in hand with the domestic situation, which of course is our first concern, is the world situation, and I want to emphasize to you that the domestic situation is inevitably and deeply tied in with the conditions in all of the other nations of the world. In other words, we can get, in all probability, some measure of return to prosperity in the United States, but it will not be permanent unless we can get a return to prosperity all over the world. In the conferences that we have held and are holding with the leaders of other nations, we are seeking four great objectives. First, a general reduction of armaments, and through this the removal of the fear of invasion and of armed attack, and at the same time a reduction in armament costs, in order to help in the balancing of government budgets and in the reduction of taxation. Secondly, a cutting down of the trade barriers, in order to restart the flow of an exchange of crops and goods between nations. Third, we seek the setting up of a stabilization of currencies, in order that trade and commerce can make contracts ahead. And fourth, we seek the re-establishment of friendly relations and greater confidence between all nations. Our foreign visitors these past three weeks have responded to these purposes in a very helpful way. All of the nations have suffered alike in this great depression. They have all reached the conclusion that each can best be helped by the common action of all. And it is in this spirit that our visitors have met with us and discussed our common problems. The great international conference of this summer that lies before us must succeed. The future of the world demands it, and we have each of us pledged ourselves to the best joint efforts to that end. To you, the people of this country, all of us in Washington, the members of the Congress and the members of this administration, owe a profound debt of gratitude. Throughout the Depression you have been patient, you have granted us wide powers, you have encouraged us with a widespread approval of our purposes. Every ounce of strength, every resource at our command, we have devoted and we are devoting to the end of justifying your confidence. We are encouraged to believe that a wise and sensible beginning has been made. In the present spirit of mutual confidence, in the present spirit of mutual encouragement, we go forward. In conclusion, my friends, may I express to the National Broadcasting Company and to the Columbia Broadcasting System my thanks for the facilities which they have made available to me tonight. End of Section 2 Recording by Maria Casper Section 3 of The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt July 24, 1933 after the adjournment of the historical special session of Congress five weeks ago, I purposefully refrained from addressing you for two very good reasons. First, I think that we all wanted the opportunity of a little quiet thought to examine and assimilate in a mental picture the crowding events of the hundred days which had been devoted to the starting of the wheels of the New Deal. Secondly, I wanted a few weeks in which to set up the new administrative organization and to see the first fruits of our careful planning. 
I think it will interest you if I set forth the fundamentals of this planning for national recovery. And this, I am very certain, will make it abundantly clear to you that all of the proposals and all of the legislation since the fourth day of March have not been just a collection of haphazard schemes, but rather the orderly component parts of a connected and logical whole. Long before Inauguration Day, I became convinced that individual effort and local effort and even disjointed federal effort had failed and of necessity would fail and, therefore, that a rounded leadership by the federal government had become a necessity both of theory and of fact. Such leadership, however, had its beginning in preserving and strengthening the credit of the United States government, because without that no leadership was a possibility. For years the government had not lived within its income. The immediate task was to bring our regular expenses within our revenues. That has been done. It may seem inconsistent for a government to cut down its regular expenses and, at the same time, to borrow and to spend billions for an emergency. But it is not inconsistent because a large portion of the emergency money has been paid out in the form of sound loans which will be repaid to the Treasury over a period of years, and to cover the rest of the emergency money we have imposed taxes to pay the interest and the installments on that part of the debt. So you will see that we have kept our credit good. We have built a granite foundation in a period of confusion. That foundation of the federal credit stands there broad and sure. It is the base of the whole recovery plan. Then came the part of the problem that concerned the credit of the individual citizens themselves. You and I know of the banking crisis and of the great danger to the savings of our people. On March 6th, every national bank was closed. One month later, 90% of the deposits in the national banks had been made available to the depositors. Today, only about 5% of the deposits in national banks are still tied up. The condition relating to state banks, while not quite so good on a percentage basis, is showing a steady reduction in the total of frozen deposits a result much better than we had expected three months ago. The problem of the credit of the individual was made more difficult because of another fact. The dollar was a different dollar from the one with which the average debt had been incurred. For this reason, large numbers of people were actually losing possession of and title to their farms and homes. All of you know the financial steps which have been taken to correct this inequality. In addition, the Home Loan Act, the Farm Loan Act, and the Bankruptcy Act were passed. It was a vital necessity to restore purchasing power by reducing the debt and interest charges upon our people. But while we were helping people to save their credit, it was at the same time absolutely essential to do something about the physical needs of hundreds of thousands who were in dire straits at that very moment. Municipal and state aid were being stretched to the limit. We appropriated half a billion dollars to supplement their efforts and, in addition, as you know, we have put 300,000 young men into practical and useful work in our forests and to prevent flood and soil erosion. The wages they earn are going in greater part to the support of the nearly one million people who constitute their families. In this same classification, we can properly place the Great Public Works program running to a total of over $3 billion to be used for highways and ships and flood prevention and inland navigation and thousands of self-sustaining state and municipal improvements. Two points should be made clear in the allotting and administration of these projects. First, we are using the utmost care to choose labor-creating, quick-acting, useful projects, avoiding the smell of the pork barrel. And secondly, we are hoping that at least half of the money will come back to the government from projects which will pay for themselves over a period of years. Thus far, I have spoken primarily of the foundation stones, the measures that were necessary to reestablish credit and to head people in the opposite direction by preventing distress and providing as much work as possible through the governmental agencies. 
Now I come to the links which will build us a more lasting prosperity. I have said that we cannot attain that in a nation half boom and half broke. If all of our people have work and fair wages and fair profits, they can buy the products of their neighbors and business is good. But if you take away the wages and the profits of half of them, business is only half as good. It doesn't help much if the fortunate half is very prosperous. The best way is for everybody to be reasonably prosperous. For many years, the two great barriers to a normal prosperity have been low farm prices and the creeping paralysis of unemployment. These factors have cut the purchasing power of the country in half. I promised action. Congress did its part when it passed the Farm and Industrial Recovery Acts. Today, we are putting these two acts to work, and they will work if people understand their plain objectives. First, the Farm Act. It is based on the fact that the purchasing power of nearly half our population depends on adequate prices for farm products. We have been producing more of some crops than we consume or can sell in a depressed world market. The cure is not to produce so much. Without our help, the farmers cannot get together and cut production, and the Farm Bill gives them a method of bringing their production down to a reasonable level and of obtaining reasonable prices for their crops. I have clearly stated that this method is, in a sense, experimental, but so far as we have gone, we have reason to believe that it will produce good results. It is obvious that if we can greatly increase the purchasing power of the tens of millions of our people who make a living from farming and the distribution of farm crops, we will greatly increase the consumption of those goods which are turned out by industry. That brings me to the final step, bringing back industry along sound lines. Last autumn, on several occasions, I expressed my faith that we can make possible by democratic self-discipline in industry general increases in wages and shortening of hours sufficient to enable industry to pay its own workers enough to let those workers buy and use the things that their labor produces. This can be done only if we permit and encourage cooperative action in industry because it is obvious that without united action a few selfish men in each competitive group will pay starvation wages and insist on long hours of work. Others in that group must either follow suit or close up shop. We have seen the result of action of that kind in the continuing descent into the economic hell of the past four years. There is a clear way to reverse that process. If all employers in each competitive group agree to pay their workers the same wages, reasonable wages, and require the same hours, reasonable hours, then higher wages and shorter hours will hurt no employer. Moreover, such action is better for the employer than unemployment and low wages because it makes more buyers for his product. That is the simple idea which is the very heart of the Industrial Recovery Act. On the basis of this simple principle of everybody doing things together, we are starting out on this nationwide attack on unemployment. It will succeed if our people understand it, in the big industries, in the little shops, in the great cities, and in the small villages. There is nothing complicated about it and there is nothing particularly new in the principle. It goes back to the basic idea of society and of the nation itself that people acting in a group can accomplish things which no individual acting alone could even hope to bring about. Here is an example. In the Cotton Textile Code and in other agreements already signed, child labor has been abolished. That makes me personally happier than any other one thing with which I have been connected since I came to Washington. In the textile industry, an industry which came to me spontaneously and with a splendid cooperation as soon as the Recovery Act was signed, child labor was an old evil. But no employer acting alone was able to wipe it out. If one employer tried it, or if one state tried it, the costs of cooperation rose so high 
that it was impossible to compete with the employers or states which had failed to act. The moment the Recovery Act was passed, this monstrous thing which neither opinion nor law could reach through years of effort went out in a flash. As a British editorial put it, we did more under a code in one day than they in England had been able to do under the common law in eighty-five years of effort. I use this incident, my friends, not to boast of which has already been done, but to point the way for you to even greater cooperative efforts this summer and autumn. We are not going through another winter like the last. I doubt if ever any people so bravely and cheerfully endured a season half so bitter. We cannot ask America to continue to face such needless hardships. It is time for courageous action, and the recovery bill gives us the means to conquer unemployment with exactly the same weapon that we have used to strike down child labor. The proposition is simply this. If all employers will act together to shorten hours and raise wages, we can put people back to work. No employer will suffer because the relative level of competitive cost will advance by the same amount for all. But if any considerable group should lag or shirk, this great opportunity will pass us by and we will go into another desperate winter. This must not happen. We have sent out to all employers an agreement, which is the result of weeks of consultation. This agreement checks against the voluntary codes of nearly all the large industries which have already been submitted. This blanket agreement carries the unanimous approval of the three boards which I have appointed to advise in this, boards representing the great leaders in labor, in industry, and in social service. The agreement has already brought a flood of approval from every state, and from so wide a cross-section of the common calling of industry that I know it is fair for all. It is a plan, deliberate, reasonable, and just, intended to put into effect at once the most important of the broad principles which are being established, industry by industry, through codes. Naturally, it takes a good deal of organizing and a great many hearings and many months to get these codes perfected and signed, and we cannot wait for all of them to go through. The blanket agreements, however, which I am sending to every employer, will start the wheels turning now, and not six months from now. There are, of course, men, a few of them, who might thwart this great common purpose by seeking selfish advantage. There are adequate penalties in the law, but I am now asking the cooperation that comes from opinion and from conscience. These are the only instruments we shall use in this great summer offensive against unemployment. But we shall use them to the limit, to protect the willing from the laggard, and to make the plan succeed. In war, in the gloom of night attack, soldiers wear a bright badge on their shoulders to be sure that comrades do not fire on comrades. On that principle, those who cooperate in this program must know each other at a glance. That is why we have provided a badge of honor for this purpose, a simple design with a legend. We do our part. And I ask that all those who join with me shall display that badge prominently. It is essential to our purpose. Already all the great basic industries have come forward willingly with proposed codes, and in these codes they accept the principles leading to mass reemployment. But, important as is this heartening demonstration, the richest field for results is among the small employers, those whose contributions will give new work for from one to ten people. These smaller employers are indeed a vital part of the backbone of the country and the success of our plans lies largely in their hands. Already the telegrams and letters are pouring into the White House, messages from employers who ask that their names be placed on this special roll of honor. They represent great corporations and companies, and partnerships, and individuals. I ask that even before the dates set in the agreements which we have sent out, the employers of the country who have not already done so, the big fellows and the little fellows, shall at once write or telegraph to me personally at the White House, expressing their intention of going through with the plan. 
and it is my purpose to keep posted in the post office of every town a roll of honor of all those who join with me. I want to take this occasion to say to the 24 governors who are now in conference in San Francisco that nothing thus far has helped in strengthening this great movement than their resolutions adopted at the very outset of their meeting, giving this plan their unanimous and instant approval, and pledging to support it in their states. To the men and women whose lives have been darkened by the fact or the fear of unemployment, I am justified in saying a word of encouragement because the codes and the agreements already approved, or about to be passed upon, prove that the plan does raise wages, and that it does put people back to work. You can look on every employer who adopts the plan as one who is doing his part, and those employers deserve well of everyone who works for a living. It will be clear to you, as it is to me, that while the shirking employer may undersell his competitor, the saving he thus makes is made at the expense of his country's welfare. While we are making this great common effort, there should be no discord and dispute. This is no time to cavil or to question the standard set by this universal agreement. It is time for patience and understanding and cooperation. The workers of this country have rights under this law which cannot be taken from them and nobody will be permitted to whittle them away. But, on the other hand, no aggression is now necessary to attain those rights. The whole country will be united to get them for you. The principle that applies to the employers applies to the workers as well, and I ask you workers to cooperate in the same spirit. When Andrew Jackson, Old Hickory, died, someone asked, Will he go to heaven? And the answer was, he will if he wants to. If I am asked whether the American people will pull themselves out of this depression, I answer, they will if they want to. The essence of the plan is a universal limitation of hours of work per week for any individual by common consent, and a universal payment of wages above a minimum also by common consent. I cannot guarantee the success of this nationwide plan, but the people of this country can guarantee its success. I have no faith in cure-alls, but I believe that we can greatly influence economic forces. I have no sympathy with the professional economists who insist that things must run their course and that human agencies can have no influence on economic ills. One reason is that I happen to know that professional economists have changed their definition of economic laws every five or ten years for a very long time. But I do have faith, and retained faith, in the strength of the common purpose, and in the strength of unified action taken by the American people. That is why I am describing to you the simple purposes and the solid foundations upon which our program of recovery is built. That is why I am asking the employers of the nation to sign this common covenant with me, to sign it in the name of patriotism and humanity. That is why I am asking the workers to go along with us in a spirit of understanding and of helpfulness. End of section 3《ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ヒスト
In the same way, no reasonable person can expect that in this short space of time, during which new machinery had to be not only put to work, but first set up, that every locality, in every one of the forty-eight states of the country, could share equally and simultaneously in the trend to better times. The whole picture, however, the average of the whole territory from coast to coast, the average of the whole population of one hundred and twenty million people, shows to any person willing to look facts and action of which you and I can be proud. In the early spring of this year, there were actually, and proportionately, more people out of work in this country than in any other nation in the world. Fair estimates showed twelve or thirteen millions unemployed last March. Among those there were, of course, several millions who could be classed as normally unemployed, people who worked occasionally when they felt like it, and others who preferred not to work at all. It seems, therefore, fair to say that there were about ten millions of our citizens who earnestly, and in many cases hungrily, were seeking work and could not get it. Of these, in the short space of a few months, I am convinced that at least four millions have been given employment, or, saying it another way, forty percent of those seeking work have found it. That does not mean, my friends, that I am satisfied or that you are satisfied that our work is ended. We have a long way to go, but we are on the way. How are we constructing the edifice of recovery, the temple which, when completed, will no longer be a temple of money-changers or of beggars, but rather a temple dedicated to, and maintained for a greater social justice, a greater welfare for America, the habitation of a sound economic life, we are building, stone by stone, the columns which will support that habitation. Those columns are many in number, and though, for a moment, the progress of one column may disturb the progress on the pillar next to it, the work on all of them must proceed without let or hindrance. We all know that immediate relief for the unemployed was the first essential of such a structure, and that is why I speak first of the fact that 300,000 young men have been given employment and are being given employment all through this winter in the Civilian Conservation Corps camps in almost every part of the nation. So, too, we have, as you know, expended greater sums in cooperation with states and localities for work relief and home relief than ever before sums which, during the coming winter, cannot be lessened for the very simple reason that though several million people have gone back to work, the necessities of those who have not yet obtained work is more severe than at this time last year. Then we come to the relief that is being given to those who are in danger of losing their farms or their homes. New machinery had to be set up for farm credit, and for home credit in every one of the thirty-one hundred counties of the United States, and every day that passes is saving homes and farms to hundreds of families. I have publicly asked that foreclosures on farms and chattels and on homes be delayed until every mortgager in the country shall have had full opportunity to take advantage of federal credit. I make the further request, which many of you know has already been made through the great federal credit organizations, that if there is any family in the United States about to lose its home, or about to lose its chattels, that family should telegraph at once either to the Farm Credit Administration or the Home Owners Loan Corporation in Washington requesting their help. Two other great agencies are in full swing. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation continues to lend large sums to industry and finance with the definite objective of making easy the extending of credit to ministry, commerce, and finance. The program of public works in three months has advanced to this point. Out of a total appropriated for public works of three billion three hundred million, one billion eight hundred million has already been allocated to federal projects of all kinds, and literally in every part of the United States, and work on these is starting forward. In addition, Three hundred millions have been allocated to public works to be carried out by states, municipalities, and private organizations, such as those undertaking slum clearance. The balance of the public works money, 
nearly all of it intended for state or local projects, waits only on the presentation of proper projects by the states and localities themselves. Washington has the money and is waiting for the proper projects to which to allot it. Another pillar in the making is the Agricultural Adjustment Administration. I have been amazed by the extraordinary degree of cooperation given to the government by the cotton farmers in the South, the wheat farmers of the West, the tobacco farmers of the Southeast, and I am confident that the corn hog farmers of the Middle West will come through in the same magnificent fashion. The problem we seek to solve had been steadily getting worse for twenty years, but during the last six months we have made more rapid progress than any nation has ever made in a like period of time. It is true that in July farm commodity prices had been pushed up higher than they are today, but that push came in part from the pure speculation by people who could not tell you the difference between wheat and rye, by people who had never seen cotton growing, by people who did not know that hogs were fed on corn, people who have no real interest in the farmer and his problems. In spite, however, of the speculative reaction from the speculative advance, it seems to be well established that during the course of the year 1933, the farmers of the United States will receive 33% more dollars for what they have produced than they received in the year 1932. Put in another way, they will receive $400 in 1933, where they received $300 the year before. That, remember, is for the average of the country, for I have reports that some sections are not any better off than they were a year ago. This applies among the major products, especially to cattle raising and the dairy industry. We are going after those problems as fast as we can. I do not hesitate to say, in the simplest, clearest language of which I am capable, that although the prices of many products of the farm have gone up, and although many farm families are better off than they were last year, I am not satisfied either with the amount or the extent of the rise, and that it is definitely a part of our policy to increase the rise and to extend it to the products which have as yet felt no benefit. If we cannot do this one way, we will do it another. Do it, we will. Standing beside the pillar of the farm, the AAA, is the pillar of industry, the NRA. Its object is to put industry and business workers into employment and to increase their purchasing power through increased wages. It has abolished child labor. It has eliminated the sweatshop. It has ended 60 cents a week paid in some mills and 80 cents a week paid in some mines. The measure of the growth of this pillar lies in the total figures of reemployment which I have already given you, and in the fact that reemployment is continuing and not stopping. The secret of NRA is cooperation. That cooperation has been voluntarily given through the signing of the blanket codes and through the signing of specific codes which already include all of the greater industries of the nation. In the vast majority of cases, in the vast majority of localities, the NRA has been given support in unstinted measure. We know that there are chiselers. At the bottom of every case of criticism and obstruction we have found some selfish interest, some private acts to grind. Ninety percent of complaints come from misconception. For example, it has been said that NRA has failed to raise the price of wheat and corn and hogs, that NRA has not loaned enough money for local public works. Of course, NRA has nothing whatsoever to do with the price of farm products, nor with public works. It has to do only with industrial organization for economic planning to wipe out unfair practices and to create reemployment. Even in the field of business and industry, NRA does not apply to the rural communities or to towns of under 2,500 population, except in so far as those towns contain factories or chain stores which come under a specific code. It is also true that among the chiselers to whom I have referred, 
There are not only the big chiselers, but also petty chiselers who seek to make undue profit on untrue statements. Let me cite to you the example of the salesman in a store in a large eastern city who tried to justify the increase in the price of a cotton shirt from one dollar and a half to two dollars and a half by saying to the customer that it was due to the cotton processing tax. Actually, in that shirt there was about one pound of cotton, and the processing tax amounted to four and a quarter cents on that pound of cotton. At this point, it is only fair that I should give credit to the sixty or seventy million people who live in the cities and larger towns of the nation for their understanding and their willingness to go along with the payment of even these small processing taxes, though they know full well that the proportion of the processing taxes on cotton goods and on food products paid for by city dwellers goes 100 percent towards increasing the agricultural income of the farm dwellers of the land. The last pillar of which I speak is that of the money of the country in the banks of the country. There are two simple facts. First, the federal government is about to spend one billion dollars as an immediate loan on the frozen or non-liquid assets of all banks closed since January 1st, 1933 giving a liberal appraisal to those assets. This money will be in the hands of the depositors as quickly as it is humanly possible to get it out. Second, the government bank deposit insurance on all accounts up to $2,500 goes into effect on January 1st. We are now engaged in seeing to it that on or before that date the banking capital structure will be built by the government to the point that the banks will be in sound condition when the insurance goes into effect. Finally, I repeat what I have said on many occasions, that ever since last March the definite policy of the government has been to restore commodity price levels. The object has been the attainment of such a level as will enable agriculture and industry once more to give work to the unemployed. It has been to make possible the payment of public and private debts more nearly at the price level at which they were incurred. It has been gradually to restore a balance in the price structure so that farmers may exchange their products for the products of industry on a fairer exchange basis. It has been and is also the purpose to prevent prices from rising beyond the point necessary to attain these ends. The permanent welfare and security of every class of our people ultimately depends on our attainment of these purposes. Obviously, and because hundreds of different kinds of crops and industrial occupations in the huge territory that make up this nation are involved, we cannot reach the goal in only a few months. We may take one year or two years or three years. No one who considers the plain facts of our situation believes that commodity prices, especially agricultural prices, are high enough yet. Some people are putting the cart before the horse. They want a permanent revaluation of the dollar first. It is the government's policy to restore the price level first. I would not know, and no one else could tell, just what the permanent valuation of the dollar will be. To guess at a permanent gold valuation now would certainly require later changes caused by later facts. When we have restored the price level, we shall seek to establish and maintain a dollar which will not change its purchasing and debt-paying power during the succeeding generation. I said that in my message to the American delegation in London last July, and I say it now once more. Because of conditions in this country, and because of events beyond our control in other parts of the world, it becomes increasingly important to develop and apply the further measures which may be necessary from time to time to control the gold value of our own dollar at home. Our dollar is now altogether too greatly influenced by the accidents of international trade, by the internal policies of other nations, and by political disturbance in other continents. Therefore the United States must take firmly in its own hands the control of the gold value of our dollar. This is necessary in order to prevent dollar disturbances from swinging us away from our ultimate goal, namely, the continued recovery of our commodity prices. As a further effective means to this end, I am going to establish a government market for gold in the United States. Therefore, under the clearly defined authority of existing law, 
I am authorizing the Reconstruction Finance Corporation to buy gold newly mined in the United States at prices to be determined from time to time after consultation with the Secretary of the Treasury and the President. Whenever necessary to the end in view, we shall also buy or sell gold in the world market. My aim in taking this step is to establish and maintain continuous control. This is a policy and not an expedient. It is not to be used merely to offset a temporary fall in prices. We are thus continuing to move towards a managed currency. You will recall the dire predictions made last spring by those who did not agree with our common policies of raising prices by direct means. What actually happened stood out in sharp contrast with those predictions. Government credit is high. Prices have risen in part. Doubtless, profits of evil still exist in our midst. But government credit will be maintained, and a sound currency will accompany a rise in American commodity price level. I have told you tonight the story of our steady but sure work in building our common recovery. In my promise to you, both before and after March 4th, I made two things plain. First, that I pledged no miracles, and second, that I would do my best. I thank you for your patience and your faith. Our troubles will not be over tomorrow, but we are on our way, and we are headed in the right direction. End section 4、section、five of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Section 5. June 28, 1934. It has been several months since I have talked with you concerning the problems of government. Since January, those of us in whom you have vested responsibility have been engaged in the fulfillment of plans and policies which had been widely discussed in previous months. It seemed to us our duty not only to make the right path clear, but also to tread that path. As we review the achievements of this session of the seventy third Congress, It is made increasingly clear that its task was essentially that of completing and fortifying the work it had begun in March 1933. That was no easy task, but the Congress was equal to it. It has been well said that while there were a few exceptions, this Congress displayed a greater freedom from mere partisanship than any other peacetime Congress since the administration of President Washington himself. The session was distinguished by the extent and variety of legislation enacted, and by the intelligence and good will of debate upon these measures. I mention only a few of the major enactments. It provided for the readjustment of the debt burden through the Corporate and Municipal Bankruptcy Acts and the Farm Relief Act. It lent a hand to industry by encouraging loans to solvent industries. Unable to secure adequate help from banking institutions. It strengthened the integrity of finance through the regulation of securities exchanges. It provided a rational method of increasing our volume of foreign trade through reciprocal trading agreements. It strengthened our naval forces to conform with the intentions and permission of existing treaty rights. It made further advances toward peace and industry through the Labor Adjustment Act. It supplemented our agricultural policy through measures widely demanded by farmers themselves and intended to avert price destroying surpluses. It strengthened the hand of the federal government in its attempts to suppress gangster crime. It took definite steps toward a national housing program through an act which I signed today designed to encourage private capital in the rebuilding of the homes of the nation. It created a permanent federal body for the just regulation of all forms of communication, including the telephone, the telegraph, and the radio. Finally, and I believe most important, it reorganized, simplified, and made more fair and just our monetary system, setting up standards and policies adequate to meet the necessities of modern economic life, doing justice to both gold and silver as the metal bases. 
behind the currency of the United States. In the consistent development of our previous efforts toward the saving and safeguarding of our national life, I have continued to recognize three related steps. The first was relief, because the primary concern of any government dominated by the humane ideals of democracy is the simple principle that in a land of vast resources no one should be permitted to starve. Relief was and continues to be our first consideration. It calls for large expenditures, and will continue in modified form to do so for a long time to come. We may as well recognize that fact. It comes from the paralysis that arose as the after-effect of that unfortunate decade characterized by a mad chase for unearned riches and an unwillingness of leaders in almost every walk of life to look beyond their own schemes and speculations. In our administration of relief, we follow two principles. First, that direct giving shall, wherever possible, be supplemented by provision for useful and remunerative work. And second, that where families in their existing surroundings will in all human probability never find an opportunity for full self-maintenance, happiness, and enjoyment, we will try to give them a new chance in new surroundings. The second step was recovery and it is sufficient for me to ask each and every one of you to compare the situation in agriculture and in industry today with what it was fifteen months ago at the same time we have recognized the necessity of reform and reconstruction reform because much of our trouble today and in the past few years has been due to a lack of understanding of the elementary principles of justice and fairness by those in whom leadership in business and finance was placed reconstruction because new conditions in our economic life as well as old but neglected conditions had to be corrected substantial gains well known to all of you have justified our course i could cite statistics to you as unanswerable measures of our national progress statistics to show the gain in the average weekly pay envelope of workers in the great majority of industries statistics to show hundreds of thousands re-employed in private industries and other hundreds of thousands given new employment through the expansion of direct and indirect government assistance of many kinds although of course there are those exceptions in professional pursuits whose economic improvement of necessity will be delayed i also could cite statistics to show the great rise in the value of farm products statistics to prove the demand for consumers goods ranging all the way from food and clothing to automobiles and of late to prove the rise in the demand for durable goods statistics to cover the great increase in bank deposits and to show the scores of thousands of homes and of farms which have been saved from foreclosure but the simplest way for each of you to judge recovery lies in the plain facts of your own individual situation are you better off than you were last year? Are your debts less burdensome? Is your bank account more secure? Are your working conditions better? Is your faith in your own individual future more firmly grounded? Also, let me put to you another simple question. Have you as an individual paid too high a price for these gains? Plausible self-seekers and theoretical diehards will tell you of the loss of individual liberty Answer this question also out of the facts of your own life. Have you lost any of your rights or liberty or constitutional freedom of action and choice? Turn to the Bill of Rights of the Constitution, which I have solemnly sworn to maintain, and under which your freedom rests secure. Read each provision of that Bill of Rights, and ask yourself whether you personally have suffered the impairment of a single jot of these great assurances. I have no question in my mind as to what your answer will be. The record is written in the experiences of your own personal lives. In other words, it is not the overwhelming majority of the farmers or manufacturers or workers who deny the substantial gains of the past year. The most vociferous of the doubting Thomases may be divided roughly into two groups. First, those who seek special political privilege, and second, those who seek special financial privilege. About a year ago, I used as an illustration the 90% of the cotton manufacturers 
of the United States, who wanted to do the right thing by their employees and by the public, but were prevented from doing so by the 10% who undercut them by unfair practices and un-American standards. It is well for us to remember that humanity is a long way from being perfect, and that a selfish minority in every walk of life, farming, business, finance, and even government service itself, will always continue to think of themselves first, and their fellow beings second. In the working out of a great national program which seeks the primary good of the greater number, it is true that the toes of some people are being stepped on and are going to be stepped on. But these toes belong to the comparative few who seek to retain or to gain position or riches or both by some shortcut which is harmful to the greater good. In the execution of the powers conferred on it by Congress, the administration needs and will tirelessly seek the best ability that the country affords. Public service offers better rewards in the opportunity for service than ever before in our history. Not great salaries, but enough to live on. In the building of this service there are coming to us men and women with ability and courage from every part of the Union. The days of the seeking of mere party advantage through the misuse of public power are drawing to a close. We are increasingly demanding and getting devotion to the public service on the part of every member of the administration, high and low. The program of the past year is definitely in operation, and that operation month by month is being made to fit into the web of old and new conditions. This process of evolution is well illustrated by the constant changes in detailed organization and method going on in the National Recovery Administration. With every passing month, we are making strides in the orderly handling of relationship between employees and employers. Conditions differ, of course, in almost every part of the country and in almost every industry. Temporary methods of adjustment are being replaced by more permanent machinery and, I am glad to say, by a growing recognition on the part of employers and employees of the desirability of maintaining fair relationships all around. So also, while almost everybody has recognized the tremendous strides in the elimination of child labor, in the payment of not less than fair minimum wages, and in the shortening of hours, we are still feeling our way in solving problems which relate to self-government in industry, especially where such self-government tends to eliminate the fair operation of competition. In this same process of evolution, we are keeping before us the objectives of protecting, on the one hand, industry against chiselers within its own ranks, and on the other hand, the consumer through the maintenance of reasonable competition for the prevention of the unfair skyrocketing of retail prices. But, in addition to this, our immediate task, we must still look to the larger future. I have pointed out to the Congress that we are seeking to find the way once more to well-known, long-established, but to some degree forgotten ideals and values. We seek the security of the men, women, and children of the nation. That security involves added means of providing better homes for the people of the nation. That is the first principle of our future program. The second is to plan the use of land and water resources of this country to the end that the means of livelihood of our citizens may be more adequate to meet their daily needs. And finally, the third principle is to use the agencies of government to assist in the establishment of means to provide sound and adequate protection against the vicissitudes of modern life, in other words, social insurance. Later in the year I hope to talk with you more fully about these plans. A few timid people, who fear progress, will try to give you new and strange names for what we are doing. Sometimes they will call it fascism, sometimes communism, sometimes regimentation, sometimes socialism. But in so doing, they are trying to make very complex and theoretical something that is really very simple and very practical. I believe in practical explanations and in practical policies. I believe that what we are doing today is a necessary fulfillment of what Americans have always been doing, 
a fulfillment of old and tested American ideals. Let me give you a simple illustration. While I am away from Washington this summer, a long-needed renovation of and addition to our White House office building is to be started. The architects have planned a few new rooms built into the present all-too-small one-story structure. We are going to include in this addition and in this renovation modern electric wiring and modern plumbing and modern means of keeping the offices cool in the hot Washington summers. But the structural lines of the old executive office building will remain. The artistic lines of the White House buildings were the creation of master builders when our republic was young. The simplicity and the strength of the structure remain in the face of every modern test. But within this magnificent pattern, the necessities of modern government business require constant reorganization and rebuilding. If I were to listen to the arguments of some prophets of calamity who are talking these days, I should hesitate to make these alterations. I should fear that while I am away for a few weeks the architects might build some strange new Gothic tower, or a factory building, or perhaps a replica of the Kremlin or of the Potsdam Palace. But I have no such fears. The architects and builders are men of common sense and of artistic American tastes. They know that the principles of harmony and necessity itself require that the building of the new structure shall blend with the essential lines of the old. It is this combination of the old and the new that marks orderly, peaceful progress, not only in building buildings, but in building government itself. Our new structure is a part of and a fulfillment of the old. All that we do seeks to fulfill the historic traditions of the American people. Other nations may sacrifice democracy for the transitory stimulation of old and discredited autocracies. We are restoring confidence and well-being under the rule of the people themselves. We remain, as John Marshall said a century ago, emphatically and truly a government of the people. Our government, in form and in substance, emanates from them. Its powers are granted by them and are to be exercised directly on them and for their benefits. Before I close, I want to tell you of the interest and pleasure with which I look forward to the trip on which I hope to start in a few days. It is a good thing for everyone who can possibly do so to get away at least once a year for a change of scene. I do not want to get into the position of not being able to see the forest because of the thickness of the trees. I hope to visit our fellow Americans in Puerto Rico, in the Virgin Islands, in the Canal Zone, and in Hawaii. And incidentally, it will give me an opportunity to exchange a friendly word of greeting to the presidents of our sister republics, Haiti, Colombia, and Panama. After four weeks on board ship, I plan to land at a port in our Pacific Northwest. And then will come the best part of the whole trip, for I am hoping to inspect a number of our new great national projects on the Columbia, Missouri, and Mississippi rivers, to see some of our national parks, and incidentally, to learn much of actual conditions during the trip across the continent back to Washington. While I was in France during the war, our boys used to call the United States God's country. Let us make it and keep it God's country. End of section 5。section 6 of the fireside chats of franklin delano roosevelt。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。the fireside chats of franklin delano roosevelt。by franklin d roosevelt section six september thirty nineteen thirty four three months have passed since i talked with you shortly after the adjournment of the congress tonight i continue that report though because of the shortness of time i must defer a number of subjects to a later date recently the most notable public questions that have concerned us all 
have had to do with industry and labor and with respect to these certain developments have taken place which i consider of importance i am happy to report that after years of uncertainty culminating in the collapse of the spring of nineteen thirty three we are bringing order out of the old chaos with a greater certainty of the employment of labor at a reasonable wage and of more business at a fair profit these governmental and industrial developments hold promise of new achievements for the nation men may differ as to the particular form of governmental activity with respect to industry and business but nearly all are agreed that private enterprise in times such as these cannot be left without assistance and without reasonable safeguards lest it destroy not only itself but also our processes of civilization the underlying necessity for such activity is indeed as strong now as it was years ago when elihu root said the following very significant words instead of the give and take of free individual contract the tremendous power of organization has combined great aggregations of capital in enormous industrial establishments working through vast agencies of commerce and employing great masses of men in movements of production and transportation and trade so great in the mass that each individual concerned in them is quite helpless by himself the relations between the employer and the employed between the owners of aggregated capital and the units of organized labor between the small producer the small trader the consumer and the great transporting and manufacturing and distributing agencies all present new questions for the solution of which the old reliance upon the free action of individual wills appears quite inadequate and in many directions the intervention of that organized control which we call government seems necessary to produce the same result of justice and right conduct which obtained through the attrition of individuals before the new conditions arose it was in this spirit thus described by secretary root that we approached our task of reviving private enterprise in march nineteen thirty three our first problem was of course the banking situation because as you know the banks had collapsed some banks could not be saved but the great majority of them either through their own resources or with government aid have been restored to complete public confidence this has given safety to millions of depositors in these banks closely following this great constructive effort we have through various federal agencies saved debtors and creditors alike in many other fields of enterprise such as loans on farm mortgages and home mortgages loans to the railroads and insurance companies and finally help for homeowners and industry itself in all of these efforts the government has come to the assistance of business and with the full expectation that the money used to assist these enterprises will eventually be repaid i believe it will be the second step we have taken in the restoration of normal business enterprise has been to clean up thoroughly unwholesome conditions in the field of investment in this we have had assistance from many bankers and businessmen most of whom recognize the past evils in the banking system in the sale of securities in the deliberate encouragement of stock gambling in the sale of unsound mortgages and in many other ways in which the public lost billions of dollars they saw that without changes in the policies and methods of investment there could be no recovery of public confidence in the security of savings the country now enjoys the safety of bank savings 
under the new banking laws the careful checking of new securities under the securities act and the curtailment of rank stock speculation through the securities exchange act i sincerely hope that as a result people will be discouraged in unhappy efforts to get rich quick by speculating in securities the average person almost always loses only a very small minority of the people of this country believe in gambling as a substitute for the old philosophy of benjamin franklin that the way to wealth is through work in meeting the problems of industrial recovery the chief agency of the government has been the national recovery administration under its guidance trades and industries covering over ninety per cent of all industrial employees have adopted codes of fair competition which have been approved by the president under these codes in the industries covered child labor has been eliminated the workday and the work week have been shortened minimum wages have been established and other wages adjusted toward a rising standard of living the emergency purpose of the nra was to put men to work and since its creation more than four million persons have been re-employed in great part through the cooperation of american business brought about under the codes benefits of the industrial recovery program have come not only to labor in the form of new jobs in relief from overwork and in relief from underpay but also to the owners and managers of industry because together with a great increase in the payrolls there has come a substantial rise in the total of industrial profits a rise from a deficit figure in the first quarter of nineteen thirty three to a level of sustained profits within one year from the inauguration of n r a now it should not be expected that even employed labor and capital would be completely satisfied with present conditions employed workers have not by any means all enjoyed a return to the earnings of prosperous times although millions of hitherto underprivileged workers are today far better paid than ever before also billions of dollars of invested capital have today a greater security of present and future earning power than before this is because of the establishment of fair competitive standards and because of relief from unfair competition in wage cutting which depresses markets and destroys purchasing power but it is an undeniable fact that the restoration of other billions of sound investments to a reasonable earning power could not be brought about in one year there is no magic formula no economic panacea which could simply revive overnight the heavy industries and the trades dependent upon them nevertheless the gains of trade and industry as a whole have been substantial in these gains and in the policies of the administration there are assurances that hearten all forward-looking men and women with the confidence that we are definitely rebuilding our political and economic system on the lines laid down by the new deal lines which as i have so often made clear are in complete accord with the underlying principles of orderly popular government which americans have demanded since the white man first came to these shores we count in the future as in the past on the driving power of individual initiative and the incentive of fair private profit strengthened with the acceptance of those obligations to the public interest which rest upon us all we have the right to expect that this driving power will be given patriotically and wholeheartedly to our nation we have passed through the formative period of code-making in the national recovery administration 
and have effected a reorganization of the NRA suited to the needs of the next phase, which is, in turn, a period of preparation for legislation which will determine its permanent form. In this recent reorganization, we have recognized three distinct functions. First, the legislative or policy-making function. Second, the administrative function of code-making and revision. And third, the judicial function, which includes enforcement, consumer complaints, and the settlement of disputes between employers and employees and between one employer and another. We are now prepared to move into this second phase on the basis of our experience in the first phase under the able and energetic leadership of General Johnson. We shall watch carefully the working of this new machinery for the second phase of NRA, modifying it where it needs modification, and finally making recommendations to the Congress, in order that the functions of NRA, which have proved their worth, may be made a part of the permanent machinery of government. Let me call your attention to the fact that the National Industrial Recovery Act gave businessmen the opportunity they had sought for years to improve business conditions through what has been called self-government in industry. If the codes which have been written have been too complicated, if they have gone too far in such matters as price-fixing and limitation of production, let it be remembered that so far as possible, consistent with the immediate public interest of this past year and the vital necessity of improving labor conditions, the representatives of trade and industry were permitted to write their ideas into the codes. It is now time to review these actions as a whole, to determine through deliberative means in the light of experience, from the standpoint of the good of the industries themselves, as well as the general public interest, whether the methods and policies adopted in the emergency have been best calculated to promote industrial recovery and a permanent improvement of business and labor conditions. There may be a serious question as to the wisdom of many of those devices to control production or to prevent destructive price cutting, which many business organizations have insisted were necessary, or whether their effect may have been to prevent that volume of production which would make possible lower prices and increased employment. Another question arises as to whether in fixing minimum wages on the basis of an hourly or weekly wage we have reached into the heart of the problem, which is to provide such annual earnings for the lowest paid worker as will meet his minimum needs. We also question the wisdom of extending code requirements suited to the great industrial centers and to large employers to the great number of small employers in the smaller communities. During the last twelve months, our industrial recovery has been to some extent retarded by strikes, including a few of major importance. I would not minimize the inevitable losses to employers and employees and to the general public through such conflicts, but I would point out that the extent and severity of labor disputes during this period has been far less than in any previous comparable period. When the businessmen of the country were demanding the right to organize themselves adequately to promote their legitimate interests, when the farmers were demanding legislation which would give them opportunities and incentives to organize themselves for a common advance, it was natural that the workers should seek and obtain a statutory declaration of their constitutional right to organize themselves for collective bargaining as embodied in Section 7A of the National Industrial Recovery Act. Machinery set up by the federal government has provided some new methods of adjustment. 
both employers and employees must share the blame of not using them as fully as they should the employer who turns away from impartial agencies of peace who denies freedom of organization to his employees or fails to make every reasonable effort at a peaceful solution of their differences is not fully supporting the recovery effort of his government the workers who turn away from these same impartial agencies and decline to use their good offices to gain their ends are likewise not fully cooperating with their government it is time that we made a clean-cut effort to bring about that united action of management and labor which is one of the high purposes of the recovery act we have passed through more than a year of education step by step we have created all the government agencies necessary to ensure as a general rule industrial peace with justice for all those willing to use these agencies whenever their voluntary bargaining fails to produce a necessary agreement there should be at least a full and fair trial given to these means of ending industrial warfare and in such an effort we should be able to secure for employers and employees and consumers the benefits that all derive from the continuous peaceful operation of our essential enterprises accordingly i propose to confer within the coming month with small groups of those truly representative of large employers of labor and of large groups of organized labor in order to seek their cooperation in establishing what i may describe as a specific trial period of industrial peace from those willing to join in establishing this hoped-for period of peace i shall seek assurances of the making and maintenance of agreements which can be mutually relied upon under which wages hours and working conditions may be determined and any later adjustments shall be made either by agreement or in case of disagreement through the mediation or arbitration of state or federal agencies i shall not ask either employers or employees permanently to lay aside the weapons common to industrial war but i shall ask both groups to give a fair trial to peaceful methods of adjusting their conflicts of opinion and interest and to experiment for a reasonable time with measures suitable to civilize our industrial civilization closely allied to the nra is the program of public works provided for in the same act and designed to put more men back to work both directly on the public works themselves and indirectly in the industries supplying the materials for these public works to those who say that our expenditures for public works and other means for recovery are a waste that we cannot afford i answer that no country however rich can afford the waste of its human resources demoralization caused by vast unemployment is our greatest extravagance morally it is the greatest menace to our social order some people try to tell me that we must make up our minds that for the future we shall permanently have millions of unemployed just as other countries have had them for over a decade what may be necessary for those countries is not my responsibility to determine but as for this country i stand or fall by my refusal to accept as a necessary condition of our future a permanent army of unemployed on the contrary we must make it a national principle that we will not tolerate a large army of unemployed and that we will arrange our national economy to end our present unemployment as soon as we can and then to take wise measures against its return i do not want to think that it is the destiny of any american to remain permanently on relief rolls
those fortunately few in number who are frightened by boldness and cowed by the necessity for making decisions complain that all we have done is unnecessary and subject to great risks now that these people are coming out of their storm cellars they forget that there ever was a storm they point to england they would have you believe that england has made progress out of her depression by a do-nothing policy by letting nature take her course england has her peculiarities and we have ours but i do not believe any intelligent observer can accuse england of undue orthodoxy in the present emergency did england let nature take her course no did england hold to the gold standard when her reserves were threatened no has england gone back to the gold standard today no did england hesitate to call in ten billion dollars of her war bonds bearing five per cent interest to issue new bonds therefore bearing only three and one half per cent interest thereby saving the british treasury one hundred and fifty million dollars a year in interest alone no and let it be recorded that the british bankers helped is it not a fact that ever since the year nineteen o nine great britain in many ways has advanced further along lines of social security than the united states is it not a fact that relations between capital and labor on the basis of collective bargaining are much further advanced in great britain than in the united states it is perhaps not strange that the conservative british press has told us with pardonable irony that much of our new deal program is only an attempt to catch up with english reforms that go back ten years or more nearly all americans are sensible and calm people we do not get greatly excited nor is our peace of mind disturbed whether we be business men or workers or farmers by awesome pronouncements concerning the unconstitutionality of some of our measures of recovery and relief and reform we are not frightened by reactionary lawyers or political editors all of these cries have been heard before more than twenty years ago when theodore roosevelt and woodrow wilson were attempting to correct abuses in our national life the great chief justice white said there is great danger it seems to me to arise from the constant habit which prevails where anything is opposed or objected to of referring without rhyme or reason to the constitution as a means of preventing its accomplishment thus creating the general impression that the constitution is but a barrier to progress instead of being the broad highway through which alone true progress may be enjoyed in our efforts for recovery we have avoided on the one hand the theory that business should and must be taken over into an all-embracing government we have avoided on the other hand the equally untenable theory that it is an interference with liberty to offer reasonable help when private enterprise is in need of help the course we have followed fits the american practice of government a practice of taking action step by step of regulating only to meet concrete needs a practice of courageous recognition of change i believe with abraham lincoln that the legitimate object of government is to do for a community of people whatever they need to have done but cannot do at all or cannot do so well for themselves in their separate and individual capacities i am not for a return to that definition of liberty under which for many years a free people were being gradually regimented into the service of the privileged few i prefer and i am sure you prefer that broader definition of liberty 
under which we are moving forward to greater freedom to greater security for the average man than he has ever known before in the history of america end of section six recording by linda johnson section seven of the fireside chats of franklin delano roosevelt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the fireside chats of franklin delano roosevelt by franklin d roosevelt section seven april twenty eighth nineteen thirty five since my annual message to the congress on january fourth last i have not addressed the general public over the air in the many weeks since that time the congress has devoted itself to the arduous task of formulating legislation necessary to the country's welfare it has made and is making distinct progress before i come to any of the specific measures however I want to leave in your minds one clear fact. The administration and the Congress are not proceeding in any haphazard fashion in this task of government. Each of our steps has a definite relationship to every other step. The job of creating a program for the nation's welfare is, in some respects, like the building of a ship. At different points on the coast where I often visit, they build great sea-going ships. When one of these ships is under construction and the steel frames have been set in the keel, it is difficult for a person who does not know ships to tell how it will finally look when it is sailing the high seas. It may seem confused to some, but out of the multitude of detailed parts that go into the making of the structure, the creation of a useful instrument for man ultimately comes. It is that way with the making of a national policy. The objective of the nation has greatly changed in three years. Before that time, individual self-interest and group selfishness were paramount in public thinking. The general good was at a discount. Three years of hard thinking have changed the picture. More and more people, because of clearer thinking and a better understanding, are considering the whole rather than a mere part relating to one section or to one crop or to one industry or to an individual private occupation. That is a tremendous gain for the principles of democracy. The overwhelming majority of people in this country know how to sift the wheat from the chaff in what they hear and what they read. They know that the process of the constructive rebuilding of America cannot be done in a day or a year, but that it is being done in spite of the few who seek to confuse them and to profit by their confusion. Americans as a whole are feeling a lot better a lot more cheerful than for many, many years. The most difficult place in the world to get a clear, open perspective of the country as a whole is Washington. I am reminded sometimes of what President Wilson once said, So many people come to Washington who know things that are not so, and so few people who know anything about what the people of the United States are thinking about. That is why I occasionally leave this scene of action for a few days to go fishing or back home to Hyde Park, so that I can have a chance to think quietly about the country as a whole, to get away from the trees, as they say, and to look at the whole forest. This duty of seeing the country in a long-range perspective is one which, in a very special manner, attaches to this office to which you have chosen me. Did you ever stop to think that there are, after all, only two positions in the nation that are filled by the vote of all the voters, the President and the Vice-President? 
that makes it particularly necessary for the vice president and for me to conceive of our duty toward the entire country i speak therefore tonight to and of the american people as a whole my most immediate concern is in carrying out the purposes of the great work program just enacted by the congress its first objective is to put men and women now on the relief rolls to work and incidentally to assist materially in our already unmistakable march toward recovery i shall not confuse my discussion by a multitude of figures so many figures are quoted to prove so many things sometimes it depends upon what paper you read and what broadcast you hear therefore let us keep our minds on two or three simple essential facts in connection with this problem of unemployment it is true that while business and industry are definitely better our relief rolls are still too large however for the first time in five years the relief rolls have declined instead of increased during the winter months they are still declining the simple fact is that many million more people have private work today than two years ago today or one year ago today and every day that passes offers more chances to work for those who want to work in spite of the fact that unemployment remains a serious problem here as in every other nation we have come to recognize the possibility and the necessity of certain helpful remedial measures these measures are of two kinds the first is to make provisions intended to relieve to minimize and to prevent future unemployment the second is to establish the practical means to help those who are unemployed in this present emergency our social security legislation is an attempt to answer the first of these questions our works relief program the second the program for social security now pending before the congress is a necessary part of the future unemployment policy of the government while our present and projected expenditures for work relief are wholly within the reasonable limits of our national credit resources it is obvious that we cannot continue to create governmental deficits for that purpose year after year we must begin now to make provision for the future that is why our social security program is an important part of the complete picture it proposes by means of old age pensions to help those who have reached the age of retirement to give up their jobs and thus give to the younger generation greater opportunities for work and to give to all a feeling of security as they look toward old age the unemployment insurance part of the legislation will not only help to guard the individual in future periods of layoff against dependence upon relief but it will by sustaining purchasing power cushion the shock of economic distress another helpful feature of unemployment insurance is the incentive it will give to employers to plan more carefully in order that unemployment may be prevented by the stabilizing of employment itself provisions for social security however are protections for the future our responsibility for the immediate necessities of the unemployed has been met by the congress through the most comprehensive work plan in the history of the nation our problem is to put to work three and one half million employable persons now on the relief rolls it is a problem quite as much for private industry as for the government we are losing no time getting the government's vast work relief program under way and we have every reason to believe that it should be in full swing by autumn in directing it i shall recognize six fundamental principles one the projects should be useful two projects shall be of a nature that a considerable portion of the money spent 
will go into wages for labor three projects will be sought which promise ultimate return to the federal treasury of a considerable proportion of the costs four funds allotted for each project should be actually and promptly spent and not held over until later years five in all cases projects must be of a character to give employment to those on the relief rolls six projects will be allocated to localities or relief areas in relation to the number of workers on relief rolls in those areas i next want to make it clear exactly how we shall direct the work one i have set up a division of applications and information to which all proposals for the expenditure of money must go for preliminary study and consideration two after the division of applications and information has sifted those projects they will be sent to an allotment division composed of representatives of the more important governmental agencies charged with carrying on work relief projects the group will also include representatives of cities and of labor farming banking and industry this allotment division will consider all of the recommendations submitted to it and such projects as they approve will be next submitted to the president who under the act is required to make final allocations three the next step will be to notify the proper government agency in whose field the project falls and also to notify another agency which i am creating a progress division this division will have the duty of coordinating the purchases of materials and supplies and of making certain that people who are employed will be taken from the relief rolls it will also have the responsibility of determining work payments in various localities of making full use of existing employment services and to assist people engaged in relief work to move as rapidly as possible back into private employment when such employment is available moreover this division will be charged with keeping projects moving on schedule four i have felt it to be essentially wise and prudent to avoid so far as possible the creation of new governmental machinery for supervising this work the national government now has at least sixty different agencies with the staff and the experience and the competence necessary to carry on the 250 or 300 kinds of work that will be undertaken these agencies therefore will simply be doing on a somewhat enlarged scale the same sort of things that they have been doing this will make certain that the largest possible portion of the funds allotted will be spent for actually creating new work and not for building up expensive overhead organizations here in washington for many months preparations have been under way the allotment of funds for desirable projects has already begun the key men for the major responsibilities of this great task already have been selected i well realize that the country is expecting before this year is out to see the dirt fly as they say in carrying on the work and i assure my fellow citizens that no energy will be spared in using these funds effectively to make a major attack upon the problem of unemployment our responsibility is to all of the people in this country this is a great national crusade to destroy enforced idleness which is an enemy of the human spirit generated by this depression our attack upon these enemies must be without stint and without discrimination no sectional no political distinctions can be permitted it must however be recognized that when an enterprise of this character is extended over more than three thousand counties throughout the nation there may be occasional instances of inefficiency bad management or misuse of funds 
when cases of this kind occur there will be those of course who will try to tell you that the exceptional failure is characteristic of the entire endeavor it should be remembered that in every big job there are some imperfections there are chiselers in every walk of life there are those in every industry who are guilty of unfair practices every profession has its black sheep but long experience in government has taught me that the exceptional instances of wrongdoing in government are probably less numerous than in almost every other line of endeavor the most effective means of preventing such evils in this works relief program will be the eternal vigilance of the american people themselves i call upon my fellow citizens everywhere to cooperate with me in making this the most efficient and the cleanest example of public enterprise the world has ever seen it is time to provide a smashing answer for those cynical men who say that a democracy cannot be honest and efficient if you will help this can be done i therefore hope you will watch the work in every corner of this nation feel free to criticize tell me of instances where work can be done better or where improper practices prevail neither you nor i want criticism conceived in a purely fault-finding or partisan spirit but i am jealous of the right of every citizen to call to the attention of his or her government examples of how the public money can be more effectively spent for the benefit of the american people i now come my friends to a part of the remaining business before the congress it has under consideration many measures which provide for the rounding out of the program of economic and social reconstruction with which we have been concerned for two years i can mention only a few of them tonight but i do not want my mention of specific measures to be interpreted as lack of interest in or disapproval of many other important proposals that are pending the national industrial recovery act expires on the sixteenth of june after careful consideration i have asked the congress to extend the life of this useful agency of government as we have proceeded with the administration of this act we have found from time to time more and more useful ways of promoting its purposes no reasonable person wants to abandon our present gains we must continue to protect children to enforce minimum wages to prevent excessive hours to safeguard define and enforce collective bargaining and while retaining fair competition to eliminate so far as humanly possible the kinds of unfair practices by selfish minorities which unfortunately did more than anything else to bring about the recent collapse of industries there is likewise pending before the congress legislation to provide for the elimination of unnecessary holding companies in the public utility field i consider this legislation a positive recovery measure power production in this country is virtually back to the nineteen twenty nine peak the operating companies in the gas and electric utility field are by and large in good condition but under holding company domination the utility industry has long been hopelessly at war within itself and with public sentiment by far the greater part of the general decline in utility securities had occurred before i was inaugurated the absentee management of unnecessary holding company control has lost touch with and has lost the sympathy of the communities it pretends to serve even more significantly it has given the country as a whole an uneasy apprehension of over concentrated economic power a business that loses the confidence of its customers and the good will of the public cannot long continue to be a good risk for the investor 
this legislation will serve the investor by ending the conditions which have caused that lack of confidence and good will it will put the public utility operating industry on a sound basis for the future both in its public relations and in its internal relations this legislation will not only in the long run result in providing lower electric and gas rates to the consumer but it will protect the actual value and earning power of properties now owned by thousands of investors who have little protection under the old laws against what used to be called frenzied finance it will not destroy values not only business recovery but the general economic recovery of the nation will be greatly stimulated by the enactment of legislation designed to improve the status of our transportation agencies there is need for legislation providing for the regulation of interstate transportation by buses and trucks for the regulation of transportation by water for the strengthening of our merchant marine and air transport for the strengthening of the interstate commerce commission to enable it to carry out a rounded conception of the national transportation system in which the benefits of private ownership are retained while the public stake in these important services is protected by the public's government finally the re-establishment of public confidence in the banks of the nation is one of the most hopeful results of our efforts as a nation to re-establish public confidence in private banking we all know that private banking actually exists by virtue of the permission of and regulation by the people as a whole speaking through their government wise public policy however requires not only that banking be safe but that its resources be most fully utilized in the economic life of the country to this end it was decided more than twenty years ago that the government should assume the responsibility of providing a means by which the credit of the nation might be controlled not by a few private banking institutions but by a body with public prestige and authority the answer to this demand was the federal reserve system twenty years of experience with this system have justified the efforts made to create it but these twenty years have shown by experience definite possibilities for improvement certain proposals made to amend the federal reserve act deserve prompt and favorable action by the congress they are a minimum of wise readjustments of our federal reserve system in the light of past experience and present needs these measures i have mentioned are in large part the program which under my constitutional duty i have recommended to the congress they are essential factors in a rounded program for national recovery they contemplate the enrichment of our national life by a sound and rational ordering of its various elements and wise provisions for the protection of the weak against the strong never since my inauguration in march nineteen thirty three have i felt so unmistakably the atmosphere of recovery but it is more than the recovery of the material basis of our individual lives it is the recovery of confidence in our democratic processes and institutions we have survived all of the arduous burdens and the threatening dangers of a great economic calamity we have in the darkest moments of our national trials retained our faith in our own ability to master our destiny fear is vanishing and confidence is growing on every side renewed faith in the vast possibilities of human beings to improve their material and spiritual status through the instrumentality of the democratic form of government that faith is receiving its just reward for that we can be thankful to the god who watches over america end of section seven recording by linda johnson
Section 8 of The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt. September 6th, 1936 i have been on a journey of husbandry i went primarily to see at first-hand conditions in the drought states to see how effectively federal and local authorities are taking care of pressing problems of relief and also how they are to work together to defend the people of this country against the effects of future droughts i saw drought devastation in nine states i talked with families who had lost their wheat crop lost their corn crop lost their livestock lost the water in their well lost their garden and come through to the end of the summer without one dollar of cash resources facing a winter without feed or food facing a planting season without seed to put in the ground that was the extreme case but there are thousands and thousands of families on western farms who share the same difficulties i saw cattlemen who because of lack of grass or lack of winter feed have been completely compelled to sell all but their breeding stock and will need help to carry even these through the coming winter i saw livestock kept alive only because water had been brought to them long distances in tank cars i saw other farm families who have not lost everything but who because they have made only partial crops must have some form of help if they are to continue farming next spring i shall never forget the fields of wheat so blasted by heat that they cannot be harvested i shall never forget field after field of corn stunted earless and stripped of leaves for what the sun left the grasshoppers took i saw brown pastures which would not keep a cow on fifty acres yet i would not have you think for a single minute that there is permanent disaster in these drought regions or that the picture i saw meant depopulating these areas no cracked earth no blistering sun no burning wind no grasshoppers are a permanent match for the indomitable american farmers and stockmen and their wives and children who have carried on through desperate days and inspire us with their self-reliance their tenacity and their courage it was their father's task to make homes it is their task to keep those homes it is our task to help them win their fight first let me talk for a minute about this autumn and the coming winter we have the option in the case of families who need actual substance of putting them on the dole or putting them to work they do not want to go on the dole and they are one thousand per cent right we agree therefore that we must put them to work for a decent wage and when we reach that decision we kill two birds with one stone because these families will earn enough by working not only to subsist themselves but to buy food for their stock and seed for next year's planting into the scheme of things there fit of course the government lending agencies which next year as in the past will help with production loans every governor with whom i have talked is in full accord with this program of doing work for these farm families just as every governor agrees that the individual states will take care of their unemployables but that the cost of employing those who are entirely able and willing to work must be borne by the federal government if then we know as we do to-day the approximate number of farm families who will require some form of work relief from now on through the winter we face the question of what kind of work they should do let me make it clear that this is not a new question because it has already been answered to a greater or less extent in every one of the drought communities beginning in 1934 when we also had serious drought conditions 
the state and federal governments cooperated in planning a large number of projects many of them directly aimed at the alleviation of future drought conditions in accordance with that program literally thousands of ponds or small reservoirs have been built in order to supply water for stock and to lift the level of the underground water to protect wells from going dry thousands of wells have been drilled or deepened community lakes have been created and irrigation projects are being pushed water conservation by means such as these is being expanded as a result of this new drought all through the great plains area the western corn belt and in the states that lie further south in the middle west water conservation is not so pressing a problem here the work projects run more to soil erosion control and the building of farm to market roads spending like this is not waste it would spell future waste if we did not spend for such things now these emergency work projects provide money to buy food and clothing for the winter they keep the livestock on the farm they provide seed for a new crop and best of all they will conserve soil and water in the future in those areas most frequently hit by drought if for example in some local area the water table continues to drop and the topsoil to blow away the land values will disappear with the water and the soil people on the farms will drift into the nearby cities the cities will have no farm trade and the workers in the city factories and stores will have no jobs property values in the cities will decline if on the other hand the farms within that area remain as farms with better water supply and no erosion the farm population will stay on the land and prosper and the nearby cities will prosper too property values will increase instead of disappearing that is why it is worth our while as a nation to spend money in order to save money i have used the argument in relation only to a small area it holds good in its effect on the nation as a whole every state in the drought area is now doing and always will do business with every state outside it the very existence of the men and women working in the clothing factories of new york making clothes worn by farmers and their families of the workers in the steel mills in pittsburgh and the automobile factories of detroit and in the harvester factories of illinois depend upon the farmer's ability to purchase the commodities they produce in the same way it is the purchasing power of the workers in these factories in the cities that enables them and their wives and children to eat more beef more pork more wheat more corn more fruit and more dairy products and to buy more clothing made from cotton wool and leather in a physical and a property sense as well as in a spiritual sense we are members one of another i want to make it clear that no simple panacea can be applied to the drought problem in the whole of the drought area plans must depend on local conditions for these vary with annual rainfall soil characteristics altitude and topography water and soil conservation methods may differ in one county from those in an adjoining county work to be done in the cattle and sheep country differs in type from work in the wheat country or work in the corn belt the great plains drought area committee has given me its preliminary recommendations for a long-time program for that region using that report as a basis we are cooperating successfully and in entire accord with the governors and state planning boards as we get this program into operation the people more and more will be able to maintain themselves securely on the land that will mean a steady decline in the relief burdens which the federal government and states have had to assume in time of drought but more important it will mean a greater contribution to general national prosperity by these regions which have been hit by drought it will conserve and improve not only property values but human values the people in the drought area do not want to be dependent on federal state or any other kind of charity 
they want for themselves and their families an opportunity to share fairly by their own efforts in the progress of america the farmers of america want a sound national agricultural policy in which a permanent land use program will have an important place they want assurance against another year like nineteen thirty two when they made good crops but had to sell them for prices that meant ruin just as surely as did the drought sound policy must maintain farm prices in good crop years as well as in bad crop years it must function when we have drought it must also function when we have bumper crops the maintenance of a fair equilibrium between farm prices and the prices of industrial products is an aim which we must keep ever before us just as we must give constant thought to the sufficiency of the food supply of the nation even in bad years our modern civilization can and should devise a more successful means by which the excess supplies of bumper years can be conserved for use in lean years on my trip i have been deeply impressed with the general efficiency of those agencies of the federal state and local governments which have moved in on the immediate task created by the drought in nineteen thirty four none of us had preparation we worked without blueprints and made the mistakes of inexperience hindsight shows us this but as time has gone on we have been making fewer and fewer mistakes remember that the federal and state governments have done only broad planning actual work on a given project originates in the local community local needs are listed from local information local projects are decided on only after obtaining the recommendations and help of those in the local community who are best able to give it and it is worthy of note that on my entire trip though i asked the questions dozens of times i heard no complaint against the character of a single work relief project the elected heads of the states concerned together with their state officials and their experts from agricultural colleges and state planning boards have shown cooperation with and approval of the work which the federal government has headed i am grateful also to the men and women in all these states who have accepted leadership in the work in their locality in the drought area people are not afraid to use new methods to meet changes in nature and to correct mistakes of the past if overgrazing has injured rangelands they are willing to reduce the grazing if certain wheat lands should be returned to pasture they are willing to cooperate if trees should be planted as windbreaks or to stop erosion they will work with us if terracing or summer fallowing or crop rotation is called for they will carry them out they stand ready to fit and not to fight the ways of nature we are helping and shall continue to help the farmer to do those things through local soil conservation committees and other cooperative local state and federal agencies of government i have not the time tonight to deal with other and more comprehensive agricultural policies with this fine help we are tiding over the present emergency we are going to conserve soil conserve water and conserve life we are going to have long-time defenses against both low prices and drought we are going to have a farm policy that will serve the national welfare that is our hope for the future there are two reasons why i want to end by talking about reemployment tomorrow is labor day the brave spirit with which so many millions of working people are winning their way out of depression deserves respect and admiration it is like the courage of the farmers in the drought areas that is my first reason the second is that healthy employment conditions stand equally with healthy agricultural conditions as a buttress of national prosperity dependable employment at fair wages is just as important to the people in the towns and cities as good farm income is to agriculture 
our people must have the ability to buy the goods they manufacture and the crops they produce thus city wages and farm buying power are the two strong legs that carry the nation forward reemployment in industry is proceeding rapidly government spending was in large part responsible for keeping industry going and putting it in a position to make this reemployment possible government orders were the backlog of heavy industry government wages turned over and over again to make consumer purchasing power and to sustain every merchant in the community businessmen with their businesses small and large had to be saved private enterprise is necessary to any nation which seeks to maintain the democratic form of government in their case just as certainly as in the case of drought-stricken farmers government spending has saved government having spent wisely to save it private industry begins to take workers off the rolls of the government relief program until this administration we had no free employment service except in a few states and cities because there was no unified employment service the worker forced to move as industry moved often traveled over the country wandering after jobs which seemed always to travel just a little faster than he did he was often victimized by fraudulent practices of employment clearing houses and the facts of employment opportunities were at the disposal neither of himself nor of the employer in 1933 the united states employment service was created a cooperative state and federal enterprise through which the federal government matches dollar for dollar the funds provided by the states for registering the occupations and skills of workers and for actually finding jobs for these registered workers in private industry the federal state cooperation has been splendid already employment services are operating in thirty-two states and the areas not covered by them are served by the federal government we have developed a nationwide service with seven hundred district offices and one thousand branch offices thus providing facilities through which labor can learn of jobs available and employers can find workers last spring i expressed the hope that employers would realize their deep responsibility to take men off the relief rolls and give them jobs in private enterprise subsequently i was told by many employers that they were not satisfied with the information available concerning the skill and experience of the workers on the relief rolls on august twenty fifth i allocated a relatively small sum to the employment service for the purpose of getting better and more recent information in regard to those now actively at work on wpa projects information as to their skills and previous occupations and to keep the records of such men and women up to date for maximum service in making them available to industry tonight i am announcing the allocation of two and a half million dollars more to enable the employment service to make an even more intensive search than it has yet been equipped to make to find opportunities in private employment for workers registered with it tonight i urge the workers to cooperate with and take full advantage of this intensification of the work of the employment service this does not mean that there will be any lessening of our efforts under our wpa and pwa and other work relief programs until all workers have decent jobs in private employment at decent wages we do not surrender our responsibility to the unemployed we have had ample proof that it is the will of the american people that those who represent them in national state and local government should continue as long as necessary to discharge that responsibility but it does mean that the government wants to use resource to get private work for those now employed on government work and thus to curtail to a minimum the government expenditures for direct employment tonight i ask employers large and small throughout the nation to use the help of the state and federal employment service whenever in the general pickup of business 
they require more workers tomorrow is labor day labor day in this country has never been a class holiday it has always been a national holiday it has never had more significance as a national holiday than it has now in other countries the relationship of employer and employee has been more or less been accepted as a class relationship not readily to be broken through in this country we insist as an essential of the american way of life that the employer employee relationship should be one between free men and equals we refuse to regard those who work with hand or brain as different from or inferior to those who live from their property we insist that labor is entitled to as much respect as property but our workers with hand and brain deserve more than respect for their labor they deserve practical protection in the opportunity to use their labor at a return adequate to support them at a decent and constantly rising standard of living and to accumulate a margin of security against the inevitable vicissitudes of life the average man must have that twofold opportunity if we are to avoid the growth of a class conscious society in this country there are those who fail to read both the signs of the times and american history they would try to refuse the worker any effective power to bargain collectively to earn a decent livelihood and to acquire security it is those short-sighted ones not labor who threaten this country with that class dissension which in other countries has led to dictatorship and the establishment of fear and hatred as the dominant emotions in human life all american workers brain workers and manual workers alike and all the rest of us whose well-being depends on theirs know that our needs are one in building an orderly economic democracy in which all can profit and in which all can be secure from the kind of faulty economic direction which brought us to the brink of common ruin seven years ago there is no cleavage between white-collar workers and manual workers between artists and artisans musicians and mechanics lawyers and accountants and architects and miners tomorrow labor day belongs to all of us tomorrow labor day symbolizes the hope of all americans anyone who calls it a class holiday challenges the whole concept of american democracy the fourth of july commemorates our political freedom a freedom which without economic freedom is meaningless indeed labor day symbolizes our determination to achieve an economic freedom for the average man which will give his political freedom reality End of section 8. Section 9 of The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by franklin d roosevelt section nine march nine nineteen thirty seven part one last thursday i described in detail certain economic problems which everyone admits now face the nation for the many messages which have come to me after that speech and which it is physically impossible to answer individually I take this means of saying thank you. Tonight, sitting at my desk in the White House, I make my first radio report to the people in my second term of office. I am reminded of that evening in March four years ago when I made my first radio report to you. We were then in the midst of the great banking crisis. Soon after, with the authority of the Congress, we asked the nation to turn over all of its privately held gold, dollar for dollar, to the government of the United States. T. 
today's recovery proves how right that policy was but when almost two years later it came before the supreme court its constitutionality was upheld only by a five to four vote the change of one vote would have thrown all the affairs of this great nation back into hopeless chaos in effect four justices ruled that the right under a private contract to exact a pound of flesh was more sacred than the main objectives of the constitution to establish an enduring nation in nineteen thirty three you and i knew that we must never let our economic system get completely out of joint again that we could not afford to take the risk of another great depression we also became convinced that the only way to avoid a repetition of those dark days was to have a government with power to prevent and to cure the abuses and the inequalities which had thrown that system out of joint we then began a program of remedying those abuses and inequalities to give balance and stability to our economic system to make it bomb-proof against the causes of nineteen twenty nine today we are only part way through that program and recovery is speeding up to a point where the dangers of nineteen twenty nine are again becoming possible not this week or month perhaps but within a year or two national laws are needed to complete that program individual or local or state effort alone cannot protect us in nineteen thirty seven any better than ten years ago it will take time and plenty of time to work out our remedies administratively even after legislation is passed to complete our program of protection in time therefore we cannot delay one moment in making certain that our national government has power to carry through four years ago action did not come until the eleventh hour it was almost too late if we learned anything from the depression we will not allow ourselves to run around in new circles of futile discussion and debate always postponing the day of decision the american people have learned from the depression for in the last three national elections an overwhelming majority of them voted a mandate that the congress and the president begin the task of providing that protection not after long years of debate but now the courts however have cast doubts on the ability of the elected congress to protect us against catastrophe by meeting squarely our modern social and economic conditions we are at a crisis in our ability to proceed with that protection it is a quiet crisis there are no lines of depositors outside closed banks but to the far-sighted it is far-reaching in its possibilities of injury to america i want to talk with you very simply about the need for present action in this crisis the need to meet the unanswered challenge of one-third of a nation ill-nourished ill-clad ill-housed last thursday i described the american form of government as a three-horse team provided by the constitution to the american people so that their field might be plowed the three horses are of course the three branches of government the congress the executive and the courts two of the horses are pulling in unison today the third is not those who have intimated that the president of the united states is trying to drive that team overlook the simple fact that the president as chief executive is himself one of the three horses it is the american people themselves who are in the driver's seat 
it is the american people themselves who want the furrow ploughed it is the american people themselves who expect the third horse to pull in unison with the other two i hope that you have re-read the constitution of the united states in these past few weeks like the bible it ought to be read again and again it is an easy document to understand when you remember that it was called into being because the articles of confederation under which the original thirteen states tried to operate after the revolution showed the need of a national government with power enough to handle national problems in its preamble the constitution states that it was intended to form a more perfect union and promote the general welfare and the powers given to the congress to carry out those purposes can be best described by saying that they were all the powers needed to meet each and every problem which then had a national character and which could not be met by merely local action but the framers went further having in mind that in succeeding generations many other problems then undreamed of would become national problems they gave to the congress the ample broad powers to levy taxes and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the united states that my friends is what i honestly believe to have been the clear and underlying purpose of the patriots who wrote a federal constitution to create a national government with national power intended as they said to form a more perfect union for ourselves and our posterity for nearly twenty years there was no conflict between the congress and the court then congress passed a statute which in eighteen o three the court said violated an express provision of the constitution the court claimed the power to declare it unconstitutional and did so declare it but a little later the court itself admitted that it was an extraordinary power to exercise and through mr justice washington laid down this limitation upon it it is but a decent respect due to the wisdom the integrity and the patriotism of the legislative body by which any law is passed to presume in favor of its validity until its violation of the constitution is proved beyond all reasonable doubt but since the rise of the modern movement for social and economic progress through legislation the court has more and more often and more and more boldly asserted a power to veto laws passed by the congress and state legislatures in complete disregard of this original limitation in the last four years the sound rule of giving statutes the benefit of all reasonable doubt has been cast aside the court has been acting not as a judicial body but as a policy-making body when the congress has sought to stabilize national agriculture to improve the conditions of labor to safeguard business against unfair competition to protect our national resources and in many other ways to serve our clearly national needs the majority of the court has been assuming the power to pass on the wisdom of these acts of the congress and to approve or disapprove the public policy written into these laws that is not only my accusation it is the accusation of most distinguished justices of the present supreme court i have not the time to quote to you all the language used by dissenting justices in many of these cases but in the case holding the railroad retirement act unconstitutional for instance chief justice hughes said in a dissenting opinion 
that the majority opinion was a departure from sound principles and placed an unwarranted limitation upon the commerce clause and three other justices agreed with him in the case of holding the a a a unconstitutional justice stone said of the majority opinion that it was a tortured construction of the constitution and two other justices agreed with him in the case holding the new york minimum wage law unconstitutional justice stone said that the majority were actually reading into the constitution their own personal economic predilections and that if the legislative power is not left free to choose the methods of solving the problems of poverty subsistence and health of large numbers in the community then government is to be rendered impotent and two other justices agreed with him in the face of these dissenting opinions there is no basis for the claim made by some members of the court that something in the constitution has compelled them regretfully to thwart the will of the people in the face of such dissenting opinions it is perfectly clear that as chief justice hughes has said we are under a constitution but the constitution is what the judges say it is the court in addition to the proper use of its judicial functions has improperly set itself up as a third house of the congress a super legislature as one of the justices has called it reading into the constitution words and implications which are not there and which were never intended to be there we have therefore reached the point as a nation where we must take action to save the constitution from the court and the court from itself we must find a way to take an appeal from the supreme court to the constitution itself we want a supreme court which will do justice under the constitution not over it in our courts we want a government of laws and not of men i want as all americans want an independent judiciary as proposed by the framers of the constitution that means a supreme court that will enforce the constitution as written that will refuse to amend the constitution by the arbitrary exercise of judicial power amended by judicial say so it does not mean a judiciary so independent that it can deny the existence of facts which are universally recognized how then could we proceed to perform the mandate given us it was said in last year's democratic platform if these problems cannot be effectively solved within the constitution we shall seek such clarifying amendments as will assure the power to enact those laws adequately to regulate commerce protect public health and safety and safeguard economic security in other words we said we would seek an amendment only if every other possible means by legislation were to fail when i commenced to review the situation with the problem squarely before me i came by a process of elimination to the conclusion that short of amendments the only method which was clearly constitutional and would at the same time carry out other much needed reforms was to infuse new blood into all our courts we must have men worthy and equipped to carry out impartial justice but at the same time we must have judges who will bring to the courts a present-day sense of the constitution judges who will retain in the courts the judicial functions of a court and reject the legislative powers which the courts have today assumed in forty-five out of the forty-eight states of the union 
judges are chosen not for life but for a period of years in many states judges must retire at the age of seventy congress has provided financial security by offering life pensions at full pay for federal judges on all courts who are willing to retire at seventy in the case of supreme court justices that pension is twenty thousand dollars a year but all federal judges once appointed can if they choose hold office for life no matter how old they may get to be end of section nine recording by linda johnson Section 10 of The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt. Section 10, March 9, 1937, Part 2 what is my proposal it is simply this whenever a judge or justice of any federal court has reached the age of seventy and does not avail himself of the opportunity to retire on a pension a new member shall be appointed by the president then in office with the approval as required by the constitution of the senate of the united states that plan has two chief purposes by bringing into the judicial system a steady and continuing stream of new and younger blood i hope first to make the administration of all federal justice speedier and therefore less costly secondly to bring to the decision of social and economic problems younger men who have had personal experience and contact with modern facts and circumstances under which average men have to live and work this plan will save our national constitution from hardening of the judicial arteries the number of judges to be appointed would depend wholly on the decision of present judges now over seventy or those who would subsequently reach the age of seventy if for instance any one of the six justices of the supreme court now over the age of seventy should retire as provided under the plan no additional place would be created consequently although there never can be more than fifteen there may be only fourteen or thirteen or twelve and there may be only nine there is nothing novel or radical about this idea it seeks to maintain the federal bench in full vigor it has been discussed and approved by many persons of high authority ever since a similar proposal passed the house of representatives in eighteen sixty nine why was the age fixed at seventy because the laws of many states the practice of the civil service the regulations of the army and navy and the rules of many of our universities and of almost every great private business enterprise commonly fix the retirement age at seventy years or less the statute would apply to all the courts in the federal system there is general approval so far as the lower federal courts are concerned the plan has met opposition only so far as the supreme court of the united states itself is concerned if such a plan is good for the lower courts it certainly ought to be equally good for the highest court from which there is no appeal those opposing this plan have sought to arouse prejudice and fear by crying that i am seeking to pack the supreme court and that a baneful precedent will be established what do they mean by the words packing the court let me answer this question with a bluntness that will end all honest misunderstanding of my purposes if by that phrase packing the court it is charged 
that I wished to place on the bench spineless puppets who would disregard the law and would decide specific cases as I wish them to be decided, I make this answer, that no president fit for his office would appoint, and no senate of honorable men fit for their office would confirm that kind of appointees to the Supreme Court. But if by that phrase the charge is made that I would appoint, and the Senate would confirm justices worthy to sit beside present members of the court who understand those modern conditions, that I will appoint justices who will not undertake to override the judgment of the Congress on legislative policy, that I will appoint justices who will act as justices and not as legislators, if the appointment of such justices can be called packing the courts, then I say that I, and with me the vast majority of the American people, favor doing just that thing now. Is it a dangerous precedent for the Congress to change the number of the justices? The Congress has always had, and will have, that power. The number of justices has been changed several times before, in the administration of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, both signers of the Declaration of Independence, Andrew Jackson, Abraham Lincoln, and Ulysses S. Grant. I suggest only the addition of justices to the bench, in accordance with a clearly defined principle, relating to a clearly defined age limit. Fundamentally, if, in the future, America cannot trust the Congress it elects to refrain from abuse of our constitutional usages, democracy will have failed far beyond the importance to it of any kind of precedent concerning the judiciary. We think it so much in the public interest to maintain a vigorous judiciary that we encourage the retirement of elderly judges by offering them a life pension at full salary. Why, then, should we leave the fulfillment of this public policy to chance or make independent on upon the desire or prejudice of any individual justice? It is the clear intention of our public policy to provide for a constant flow of new and younger blood into the judiciary. Normally, every president appoints a large number of district and circuit court judges and a few members of the Supreme Court. Until my first term, practically every president of the United States has appointed at least one member of the Supreme Court. President Taft appointed five members and named a chief justice. President Wilson, three. President Harding, four, including a chief justice. President Coolidge, one. President Hoover, three, including a chief justice. Such a succession of appointments should have provided a court well balanced as to age. But chance and the disinclination of individuals to leave the Supreme Bench have now given us a court in which five justices will be over 75 years of age before next June and one over 70. Thus, a sound public policy has been defeated. I now propose that we establish by law an assurance against any such ill-balanced court in the future. I propose that hereafter, when a judge reaches the age of seventy, a new and younger judge shall be added to the court automatically. In this way, I propose to enforce a sound public policy by law, instead of leaving the composition of our federal courts, including the highest, to be determined by chance or the personal indecision of individuals. If such a law as I propose is regarded as establishing a new precedent, is it not a most desirable precedent? Like all lawyers, like all Americans, I regret the necessity of this controversy. 
but the welfare of the united states and indeed of the constitution itself is what we all must think about first our difficulty with the court today rises not from the court as an institution but from human beings within it but we cannot yield our constitutional destiny to the personal judgment of a few men who being fearful of the future would deny us the necessary means of dealing with the present this plan of mine is no attack on the court it seeks to restore the court to its rightful and historic place in our constitutional government and to have it resume its high task of building anew on the constitution a system of living law the court itself can best undo what the court has done i have thus explained to you the reasons that lie behind our efforts to secure results by legislation within the constitution i hope that thereby the difficult process of constitutional amendment may be rendered unnecessary but let us examine the process there are many types of amendment proposed each one is radically different from the other there is no substantial groups within the congress or outside it who are agreed on any single amendment it would take months or years to get substantial agreement upon the type and language of the amendment it would take months and years thereafter to get a two-thirds majority in favor of that amendment in both houses of the congress then would come the long course of ratification by three-fourths of all the states no amendment which any powerful economic interests or the leaders of any powerful political party have had reason to oppose has ever been ratified within anything like a reasonable time and thirteen states which contain only five per cent of the voting population can block ratification even though the thirty-five states with ninety-five per cent of the population are in favor of it a very large percentage of newspaper publishers chambers of commerce bar association manufacturers associations who are trying to give the impression that they really do want a constitutional amendment would be the first to exclaim as soon as an amendment was proposed oh i was for an amendment all right but this amendment you proposed is not the kind of amendment that i was thinking about i am therefore going to spend my time my efforts and my money to block the amendment although i would be awfully glad to help get some other kind of amendment ratified two groups oppose my plan on the ground that they favor a constitutional amendment the first includes those who fundamentally object to social and economic legislation along modern lines this is the same group who during the campaign last fall tried to block the mandate of the people now they are making a last stand and the strategy of that last stand is to suggest the time-consuming process of amendment in order to kill off by delay the legislation demanded by the mandate to them i say i do not think you will be able long to fool the american people as to your purposes the other groups is composed of those who honestly believe the amendment process is the best and who would be willing to support a reasonable amendment if they could agree on one to them i say we cannot rely on an amendment as the immediate or only answer to our present difficulties when the time comes for action you will find that many of those who pretend to support you will sabotage any constructive amendment which is proposed look at these strange bedfellows of yours when before have you found them really at your side in your fights for progress and remember one thing more 
even if an amendment were passed and even if in the years to come it were to be ratified its meaning would depend upon the kind of justices who would be sitting on the supreme court bench an amendment like the rest of the constitution is what the justices say it is rather than what its framers or you might hope it is this proposal of mine will not infringe in the slightest upon the civil or religious liberties so dear to every american my record as governor and president proves my devotion to those liberties you who know me can have no fear that i would tolerate the destruction by any branch of government of any part of our heritage of freedom the present attempt by those opposed to progress to play upon the fears of danger to personal liberty brings again to mind that crude and cruel strategy tried by the same opposition to frighten the workers of america in a pay envelope propaganda against the social security law the workers were not fooled by that propaganda then the people of america will not be fooled by such propaganda now i am in favor of action through legislation first because i believe that it can be passed at this session of the congress second because it will provide a reinvigorated liberal-minded judiciary necessary to furnish quicker and cheaper justice from bottom to top third because it will provide a series of federal courts willing to enforce the constitution as written and unwilling to assert legislative powers by writing into it their own political and economic policies during the past half century the balance of power between the three great branches of the federal government has been tipped out of balance by the courts in direct contradiction of the high purposes of the framers of the constitution it is my purpose to restore that balance you who know me will accept my solemn assurance that in a world in which democracy is under attack i seek to make american democracy succeed you and i will do our part end of section ten Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 11 of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. October 12th. 1937. My friends, this afternoon I have issued a proclamation calling a special session of the Congress to convene on Monday, November 15, 1937. I do this in order to give to the Congress an opportunity to consider important legislation before the regular session in January, and to enable the Congress to avoid a lengthy session next year extending through the summer. I know that many enemies of democracy will say that it is bad for business, bad for the tranquility of the country, to have a special session, even one beginning only six weeks before the regular session. But I have never had sympathy with the point of view that a session of the Congress is an unfortunate intrusion of what they call politics into our national affairs. Those who do not like democracy want to keep legislators at home. But the Congress is an essential instrument of democratic government, and democratic government can never be considered an intruder into the affairs of a democratic nation. I shall ask this special session to consider immediately certain important legislation which my recent trip through the nation convinces me the American people immediately need. This does not mean that other legislation, to which I am not referring tonight, is not important for our national well-being, but other legislation can be more readily discussed at the regular session. Anyone charged with proposing or judging national policies should have first-hand knowledge of the nation as a whole. 
That is why, again this year, I have taken trips to all parts of the country. Last spring I visited the southwest. This summer I made several trips in the east. Now I am just back from a trip all the way across the continent, and later this autumn I hope to pay my annual visit to the southeast. For a president, especially, it is a duty to think in national terms. He must think not only of this year, but of future years when someone else will be president. He must look beyond the average of prosperity and well-being of the country, for averages easily cover up danger spots of poverty and instability. He must not let the country be deceived by a merely temporary prosperity, which depends on wasteful exploitation of resources which cannot last. He must think not only of keeping us out of war today, but also of keeping us out of war in generations to come. The kind of prosperity we want is the sound and permanent kind, which is not built up temporarily at the expense of any section or group. And the kind of peace we want is the sound and permanent kind which is built on the cooperative search for peace by all the nations which want peace. The other day I was asked to state my outstanding impression gained on this recent trip. I said that it seemed to me to be the general understanding on the part of the average citizen of the broad objectives and policies which I have just outlined. Five years of fierce discussion and debate, five years of information through the radio and the moving picture, have taken the whole nation to school in the nation's business. Even those who have most attacked our objectives have, by their very criticism, encouraged the mass of our citizens to think about and understand the issues involved, and, understanding, to approve. Out of that process we have learned to think as a nation, and out of that process we have learned to feel ourselves a nation. As never before in our history, each section of America says to every other section, Thy people shall be my people. For most of the country, this has been a good year, better in dollars and cents than for many years, far better in the soundness of its prosperity. And everywhere I went I found particular optimism about the good effect on business which is expected from the steady spending by farmers of the largest farm income in many years. But we have not yet done all that must be done to make this prosperity stable. The people of the United States were checked in their efforts to prevent future piling up of huge agricultural surpluses and the tumbling prices which inevitably follow them. They were checked in their efforts to secure reasonable minimum wages and maximum hours and the end of child labor. And because they were checked, many groups in many parts of the country still have less purchasing power and a lower standard of living than the nation as a whole can permanently allow. Americans realize these facts. That is why they ask government not to stop governing simply because prosperity has come back a long way. They do not look upon government as an interloper in their affairs. On the contrary, they regard it as the most effective form of organized self-help. Sometimes I get bored sitting in Washington hearing certain people talk and talk about all that government ought not do, people who got all they wanted from government back in the days when the financial institutions and the railroads were being bailed out by government back in 1933. It is refreshing to go out through the country and feel the common wisdom that the time to repair the roof is when the sun is shining. They want the financial budget balanced, but they want the human budget balanced as well. They want to set up a national economy which balances itself with as little government subsidy as possible, for they realize that persistent subsidies ultimately bankrupt their government. They are less concerned that every detail be immediately right than they are that the direction be right. They know that just so long as we are traveling on the right road, it does not make much difference if occasionally we hit a thank-you, marm. The overwhelming majority of our citizens who live by agriculture are thinking very clearly how they want government to help them in connection with the production of crops. They want government help in two ways. First, in the control of surpluses, 
and second in the proper use of land the other day a reporter told me that he had never been able to understand why the government seeks to curtail crop production and at the same time to open up new irrigated acres he was confusing two totally separate objectives crop surplus control relates to the total amount of any major crop grown in the whole nation on all cultivated land good or bad control by the cooperation of the crop growers and with the help of the government land use on the other hand is a policy of providing each farmer with the best quality and type of land we have or can make available for his part in that total production adding good new land for diversified crops is offset by abandoning poor land now uneconomically farmed the total amount of production largely determines the price of the crop and therefore the difference between comfort and misery for the farmer if we americans were foolish enough to run every shoe factory twenty-four hours a day seven days a week we would soon have more shoes than the nation could possibly buy a surplus of shoes so great that it would have to be destroyed or given away or sold at prices far below the cost of the production that simple law of supply and demand equally affects the price of all our major crops you and i have heard big manufacturers talk about control of production by the farmer as an indefensible economy of scarcity and yet these same manufacturers never hesitate to shut down their own huge plants to throw men out of work and cut down the purchasing power of whole communities whenever they think that they must adjust their production to an oversupply of the goods they make when it is their baby who has the measles they call it not an economy of scarcity but sound business judgment of course speaking seriously what you and i want is such governmental rules of the game that labor and agriculture and industry will all produce a balanced abundance without waste so we intend this winter to find a way to prevent four and a half cent cotton nine cent corn and thirty cent wheat with all the disaster those prices mean for all of us to prevent those prices from ever coming back again to do that the farmers themselves want to cooperate to build an all-weather farm program so that in the long run prices will be more stable they believe this can be done and the national budget kept out of the red and when we have found that way to protect the farmers prices from the effects of alternating crop surpluses and crop scarcities we shall also have found a way to protect the nation's food supply from the effects of the same fluctuation we ought always to have enough food at prices within the reach of the consuming public for the consumers in the cities of america we must find a way to help the farmers to store up in years of plenty enough to avoid hardship in the years of scarcity our land use policy is a different thing i have just visited much of the work that the national government is doing to stop soil erosion to save our forests to prevent floods to produce electric power for more general use and to give people a chance to move from poor land on to better land by irrigating thousands of acres that need only water to provide an opportunity to make a good living i saw bare and burned hillsides where only a few years ago great forests were growing they are now being planted to young trees not only to stop erosion but to provide a lumber supply for the future i saw ccc boys and wpa workers building check dams and small ponds and terraces to raise the water table and make it possible for farms and villages to remain in safety where they now are i saw the harnessing of the turbulent missouri muddy with the topsoil of many states and i saw barges on new channels carrying produce and freight athwart the nation let me give you two simple illustrations of why government projects of this type have a national importance for the whole country in the boise valley in idaho i saw a district which had recently been irrigated to enormous fertility so that a family can now make a pretty good living from forty acres of its land many of the families who are making good in that valley today moved there from a thousand miles away they came from the dust strip that runs through the middle of the nation all the way from the canadian border to mexico 
a strip which includes large portions of ten states. That valley in western Idaho, therefore, assumes at once a national importance as a second chance for willing farmers. And year by year we propose to add more valleys to take care of thousands of other families who need the same kind of second chance in new green pastures. The other illustration was at the Grand Coulee Dam in the state of Washington. The engineer in charge told me that almost half of the whole cost of that dam to date had been spent for materials that were manufactured east of the Mississippi River, giving employment and wages to thousands of industrial workers in the eastern third of the nation two thousand miles away. All of this work needs, of course, a more businesslike system of planning and greater foresight than we use today. That is why I recommended to the last session of the Congress the creation of seven planning regions in which local people will originate and coordinate recommendations as to the kind of this work to be done in their particular regions. The Congress will, of course, determine the projects to be selected within the budget limits. To carry out any 20th century program, we must give the executive branch of the government 20th century machinery to work with. I recognize that democratic processes are necessarily and rightly slower than dictatorial processes, but I refuse to believe that democratic processes need to be dangerously slow. For many years we have all known that the executive and administrative departments of the government in Washington are a higgledy-piggledy patchwork of duplicate responsibilities and overlapping powers. The reorganization of this vast government machinery, which I proposed to the Congress last winter, does not conflict with the principle of the democratic process, as some people say. It only makes that process work more efficiently. On my recent trip, many people have talked to me about the millions of men and women and children who still work at insufficient wages and overlong hours. American industry has searched the outside world to find new markets, but it can create on its very doorstep the biggest and most permanent market it has ever had. It needs the reduction of trade barriers to improve its foreign markets, but it should not overlook the chance to reduce the domestic trade barrier right here, right away, without waiting for any treaty. A few more dollars a week in wages, a better distribution of jobs with a shorter working day, will almost overnight make millions of our lowest-paid workers actual buyers of billions of dollars of industrial and farm products. That increased volume of sales ought to lessen other cost of production so much that even a considerable increase in labor costs can be absorbed without imposing higher prices on the consumer. I am a firm believer in fully adequate pay for all labor, but right now I am most greatly concerned in increasing the pay of the lowest paid labor, those who are our most numerous consuming group but who today do not make enough to maintain a decent standard of living or to buy the food, the clothes, and the other articles necessary to keep our factories and our farms fully running. Far-sighted businessmen already understand and agree with this policy. They agree also that no one section of the country can permanently benefit itself or the rest of the country by maintaining standards of wages and hours far inferior to other sections of the country. Most businessmen, big and little, know that their government neither wants to put them out of business nor to prevent them from earning a decent profit. In spite of the alarms of a few who seek to regain control of American life, most businessmen, big and little, know that their government is trying to make property more secure than ever by giving every family a real chance to have a property stake in the nation. Whatever danger there may be to the property and profits of the many, if there be any danger, comes not from government's attitude toward business, but from restraints now imposed upon business by private monopolies and financial oligarchies. The average businessman knows that a high cost of living is a great deterrent to business, and that business prosperity depends much upon a low-price policy which encourages the widest possible consumption. As one of the country's leading economists recently said, the continuance of business recovery in the United States depends far more upon business policies 
business pricing policies than it does on anything that may be done or not done in Washington. Our competitive system is, of course, not altogether competitive. Anybody who buys a large quantity of manufactured goods knows this, whether it be the government or an individual buyer. We have antitrust laws, to be sure, but they have not been adequate to check the growth of many monopolies. Whether or not they might have been adequate originally, interpretation by the courts and the difficulties and delays of legal procedure have now definitely limited their effectiveness. We are already studying how to strengthen our antitrust laws in order to end monopoly, not to hurt but to free legitimate businesses. I have touched briefly on these important subjects, which taken together make a program for the immediate future. To attain it, legislation is necessary. As we plan today for the creation of ever higher standards of living for the people of the United States, we are aware that our plans may be most seriously affected by events in the world outside our borders. By a series of trade agreements, we have been attempting to recreate the trade of the world which plays so important a part in our domestic prosperity. But we know that if the world outside our borders falls into the chaos of war, world trade will be completely disrupted. Nor can we view with indifference the destruction of civilized values throughout the world. We seek peace, not only for our generation, but also for the generation of our children. We seek for them the continuance of world civilization, in order that their American civilization may continue to be invigorated by the achievements of civilized men and women in the rest of the world. I want our great democracy to be wise enough to realize that aloofness from war is not promoted by unawareness of war. In a world of mutual suspicions, peace must be affirmatively reached for. It cannot just be wished for, and it cannot just be waited for. We have now made known our willingness to attend a conference of the parties to the Nine Power Treaty of 1922, the Treaty of Washington, of which we are one of the original signatories. The purpose of this conference will be to seek, by agreement, a solution of the present situation in China. In efforts to find that solution, it is our purpose to cooperate with the other signatories to this treaty, including China and Japan. Such cooperation would be an example of one of the possible paths to follow in our search for means toward peace throughout the whole world. The development of civilization and human welfare is based on the acceptance by individuals of certain fundamental decencies in their relations with each other. The development of peace in the world is dependent, similarly, on the acceptance by nations of certain fundamental decencies in their relations with each other. Ultimately, I hope each nation will accept the fact that violations of these rules of conduct are an injury to the well-being of all nations. Meanwhile, remember that from 1913 to 1921, I personally was fairly close to world events, and in that period, while I learned much of what to do, I also learned much of what not to do. The common sense, the intelligence of America— agree with my statement that America hates war, America hopes for peace. Therefore, America actively engages in the search for peace. End of Section 11 Recording by Maria Casper Section 12 of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin Delano Roosevelt April 14, 1938, Part 1 My friends, five months have gone by since I last spoke to the people of the nation about the state of the nation. I had hoped to be able to defer this talk until next week, because, as we all know, this is Holy Week. But what I want to say to you, the people of the country, is of such immediate need, and relates so closely to the lives of human beings and the prevention of human suffering, 
that i have felt that there should be no delay in this decision i have been strengthened by the thought that by speaking to-night there may be greater peace of mind and that the hope of easter may be more real at firesides everywhere and therefore that it is not inappropriate to encourage peace when so many of us are thinking of the prince of peace five years ago we faced a very serious problem of economic and social recovery for four and a half years that recovery proceeded apace it is only in the past seven months that it has received a visible setback and it is only within the past two months as we have waited patiently to see whether the forces of business itself would counteract it that it has become apparent that government itself can no longer safely fail to take aggressive government steps to meet it this recession has not returned us to the disasters and suffering of the beginning of nineteen thirty three your money in the bank is safe farmers are no longer in deep distress and have greater purchasing power dangers of security speculation have been minimized national income is almost fifty per cent higher than in nineteen thirty two and government has an established and accepted responsibility for relief but i know that many of you have lost your jobs or have seen your friends or members of your families lose their jobs and i do not propose that the government shall pretend not to see these things i know that the effect of our present difficulties has been uneven that they have affected some groups and some localities seriously but that they have been scarcely felt in others but i conceive the first duty of government is to protect the economic welfare of all the people in all sections and in all groups I said in my message opening the last session of Congress that if private enterprise did not provide jobs this spring, government would take up the slack, that I would not let the people down. We have all learned the lesson that government cannot afford to wait until it has lost the power to act. Therefore, my friends, I have sent a message of far reaching importance to the Congress. I want to read to you tonight certain passages from that message, and to talk with you about them. In that message I analyzed the causes of the collapse of 1929 in these words. Over-speculation in and over-production of practically every article or instrument used by man. Millions of people, to be sure, had been put to work but the products of their hands had exceeded the purchasing power of their pocket-books. Under the inexorable law of supply and demand, supply so overran demand which would pay, that production was compelled to stop. Unemployment and closed factories resulted. Hence the tragic years from 1929 to 1933. I pointed out to the Congress that the national income— not the government's income, but the total of the income of all the individual citizens and families of the United States, every farmer, every worker, every banker, every professional man, and every person who lived on income derived from investments, that national income had amounted in the year 1929 to $81 billion. By 1932 this had fallen to $38 billion gradually and up until a few months ago it had risen to a total an annual total of sixty eight billion dollars a pretty good comeback from the low point i then said this to the congress but the very vigor of the recovery in both durable goods and consumers goods brought into the picture early on certain highly undesirable practices which were in large part responsible for the economic decline which began in the later months of that year again production outran the ability to buy there were many reasons for this overproduction one of them was fear fear of war abroad fear of inflation fear of nationwide strikes none of these fears have been borne out Production in many important lines of goods outran the ability of the public to purchase them. For example, through the winter and spring of 1937,
cotton factories, in hundreds of cases, were running on a three-shift basis, piling up cotton goods in the factory, and in the hands of middlemen and retailers. For example, also, automobile manufacturers not only turned out a normal increase of finished cars, but encouraged the normal increase to run into abnormal figures, using every known method to push their sales. This meant, of course, that the steel mills of the nation ran on a twenty-four-hour basis, and the tire companies and cotton factories and glass factories and others speeded up to meet the same type of abnormally stimulated demand. The buying power of the nation lagged behind. Thus, by the autumn of 1937, last autumn, the nation again had stocks on hand which the consuming public could not buy, because the purchasing power of the consuming public had not kept pace with the production. During the same period, the prices of many vital products had risen faster than was warranted. In the case of many commodities, the price to the consumer was raised well above the inflationary boom prices of 1929. In many lines of goods and materials, prices got so high that buyers and builders ceased to buy or to build. The economic process of getting out the raw materials, putting them through the manufacturing and finishing processes, selling them to the retailers, selling them to the consumer, and finally using them, got completely out of balance. The laying off of workers came upon us last autumn and has been continuing at such a pace ever since, that all of us, government and banking and business and workers, and those faced with destitution, recognize the need for action. All of this I said to the Congress today, and I repeat it to you, the people of the country, tonight. I went on to point out to the Senate and the House of Representatives that all the energies of government and business must be directed to increasing the national income, to putting more people into private jobs, to giving security and a feeling of security to all people in all walks of life. I am constantly thinking of all our people, unemployed and employed alike, of their human problems of food and clothing and homes and education and health and old age. You and I agree that security is our greatest need. The chance to work, the opportunity of making a reasonable profit in our business, whether it be a very small business or a larger one, the possibility of selling our farm products for enough money for our families to live on decently. I know these are the things that decide the well-being of all our people." Therefore, I am determined to do all in my power to help you attain that security. And because I know that the people themselves have a deep conviction that secure prosperity of that kind cannot be a lasting one, except on a basis of business fair dealing, and a basis where all, from the top to the bottom, share in the prosperity, I repeated to the Congress today that neither it nor the chief executive can afford to weaken or destroy great reforms which during the past five years have been effected on behalf of the American people. In our rehabilitation of the banking structure and of agriculture, in our provisions for adequate and cheaper credit for all types of business, in our acceptance of national responsibility for unemployment relief, in our strengthening of the credit of state and local government, in our encouragement of housing and slum clearance and home ownership, in our supervision of stock exchanges and public utility holding companies, and the issuance of new securities, in our provision for social security, the electorate of America wants no backward steps taken. We have recognized the right of labor to free organization, to collective bargaining, and machinery for the handling of labor relations is now in existence. The principles are established, even though we can all admit that through the evolution of time, administration and practices can be improved. Such improvement can come about most quickly and most peacefully through sincere efforts to understand and assist on the part of labor leaders and employers alike. 
the never-ceasing evolution of human society will doubtless bring forth new problems which will require new adjustments our immediate task is to consolidate and maintain the gains achieved in this situation there is no reason and no occasion for any american to allow his fears to be aroused or his energy and enterprise to be paralyzed by doubt or uncertainty i came to the conclusion that the present-day problem calls for action both by the government and by the people that we suffer primarily from a failure of consumer demand because of lack of buying power therefore it is up to us to create an economic upturn how and where can and should the government help to start an upward spiral i went on in my message today to propose three groups of measures and i will summarize my recommendations first i asked for certain appropriations which are intended to keep the government expenditures for work relief and similar purposes during the coming fiscal year at the same rate of expenditure as at present this includes additional money for the works progress administration additional funds for the farm security administration additional allotments for the national youth administration and more money for the civilian conservation corps in order that it can maintain the existing number of camps now in operation these appropriations made necessary by increased unemployment will cost about a billion and a quarter dollars more than the estimates which i sent to congress on the third of january second i told the congress that the administration proposes to make additional bank reserves available for the credit needs of the country about one billion four hundred million dollars of gold now in the treasury will be used to pay these additional expenses of the government and three-quarters of a billion dollars of additional credit will be made available to the banks by reducing the reserves now required by the federal reserve board these two steps taking care of the relief needs and adding to bank credits are in our best judgment insufficient by themselves to start the nation on a sustained upward movement therefore i came to the third kind of government action which i consider to be vital i said to the congress you and i cannot afford to equip ourselves with two rounds of ammunition where three rounds are necessary if we stop at relief and credit we may find ourselves without ammunition before the enemy is routed if we are fully equipped with the third round of ammunition we stand to win the battle against adversity this third proposal is to make definite additions to the purchasing power of the nation by providing new work over and above the continuing of the old work first to enable the united states housing authority to undertake the immediate construction of about three hundred million dollars of additional slum clearance projects second to renew a public works program by starting as quickly as possible about one billion dollars worth of needed permanent public improvements in our states and their counties and cities third to add one hundred million dollars to the estimate for federal aid highways in excess of the amount i recommended in january fourth to add thirty seven million dollars over and above the former estimate of sixty three million for flood control and reclamation fifth to add twenty five million dollars additional for federal buildings in various parts of the country in recommending this program i am thinking not only of the immediate economic needs of the people of the nation but also of their personal liberties the most precious possession of all americans i am thinking of our democracy and of the recent trend in other parts of the world away from the democratic ideal democracy has disappeared in several other great nations disappeared not because the people of those nations disliked democracy but because they had grown tired of unemployment and insecurity of seeing their children hungry while they sat helpless in the face of government confusion and government weakness through lack of leadership in government finally in desperation they chose to sacrifice liberty in the hope of getting something to eat we in america know that our own democratic institutions can be preserved and made to work 
but in order to preserve them we need to act together to meet the problems of the nation boldly and to prove that the practical operation of democratic government is equal to the task of protecting the security of the people end of section 12 recording by maria casper Section 13 of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. April 14, 1938, Part 2 not only our future economic soundness but the very soundness of our democratic institutions depends on the determination of our government to give employment to idle men the people of america are in agreement in defending their liberties at any cost and the first line of that defense lies in the protection of economic security your government seeking to protect democracy must prove that government is stronger than the forces of business depression history proves that dictatorships do not grow out of strong and successful governments but out of weak and helpless governments if by democratic methods people get a government strong enough to protect them from fear and starvation then their democracy succeeds but if they do not they grow impatient therefore the only sure bulwark of continuing liberty is a government strong enough to protect the interests of the people and a people strong enough and well informed enough to maintain its sovereign control over its government we are a rich nation we can afford to pay for security and prosperity without having to sacrifice our liberties into the bargain in the first century of our republic we were short of capital short of workers and short of industrial production but we were rich in free land free timber and free mineral wealth the federal government rightly assumed the duty of promoting business and relieving depression by giving subsidies of land and other resources thus from our earliest days we have had a tradition of substantial government help to our system of private enterprise but today the government no longer has vast tracts of rich land to give away and we have discovered too that we must spend large sums of money to conserve our land from further erosion and our forests from further depletion the situation is also very different from the old days because now we have plenty of capital banks and insurance companies loaded with idle money plenty of industrial productive capacity and many millions of workers looking for jobs it is following tradition as well as necessity if government strives to put idle money and idle men to work to increase our public wealth and to build up the health and strength of the people and to help our system of private enterprise to function it is going to cost us something to get out of this recession this way but the profit of getting out of it will pay for the cost several times over lost working time is lost money every day that a workman is unemployed or a machine is unused or a business organization is marking time it is a loss to the nation because of idle men and idle machines this nation lost one hundred billion dollars between nineteen twenty nine and the spring of nineteen thirty three in less than four years this year you the people of the country are making about twelve billion dollars less than last year if you think back to the experiences of the early years of this administration you will remember the doubts and fears expressed about the rising expenses of government but to the surprise of the doubters as we proceeded to carry on the program which included public works and work relief the country grew richer instead of poorer it is worth while to remember that the annual national people's income was thirty billion dollars more last year in nineteen thirty seven than it was in nineteen thirty two it is true that the national debt increased sixteen billion dollars but remember that in that increase must be included several billion dollars worth of assets which eventually will reduce that debt 
and that many billion dollars of permanent public improvements schools roads bridges tunnels public buildings parks and a host of other things meet your eye in every one of the thirty one hundred counties of the united states no doubt you will be told that the government spending program of the past five years did not cause this increase in our national income they will tell you that business revived because of private spending and investment that is true in part for the government spent only a small part of the total but that government spending acted as the trigger that set off private activity that is why the total addition to our national production and national income has been so much greater than the contribution of the government itself in pursuance of that thought i said to the congress today i want to make it clear that we do not believe that we can get an adequate rise in our national income merely by investing and lending and spending public funds it is essential in our economy that private funds must be put to work and all of us recognize that such funds are entitled to a fair profit as national income rises let us not forget that government expenditures will go down and government tax receipts will go up the government contribution of land that we once made to business was the land of all the people and the government contribution of money which we now make to business ultimately comes out of the labor of all the people it is therefore only sound morality as well as a sound distribution of buying power that the benefits of the prosperity coming from this use of the money of all the people ought to be distributed among all the people at the bottom as well as at the top consequently i am again expressing my hope that the congress will enact at this session a wage and hour bill putting a floor under industrial wages and a limit on working hours to ensure a better distribution of our prosperity a better distribution of available work and a sounder distribution of buying power you may get all kinds of impressions in regard to the total cost of this new program or in regard to the amount that will be added to the national debt it is a big program last autumn in a sincere effort to bring government expenditures and government income into closer balance the budget i worked out called for sharp decreases in government spending in the light of the present conditions those estimates were far too low this new program adds two billion and sixty two million dollars to direct treasury expenditures and another nine hundred and fifty million dollars to government loans the latter sum because they are loans will come back to the treasury in the future the net effect of the debt on the government is this between now and july first nineteen thirty nine fifteen months away the treasury will have to raise less than a billion and a half dollars of new money such an addition to the net debt of the united states need not give concern to any citizen for it will return to the people of the united states many times over in increased buying power and eventually in much greater government tax receipts because of the increase in the citizen income what i said to the congress in the close of my message i repeat to you let us unanimously recognize the fact that the federal debt whether it be twenty five billions or forty billions can only be paid if the nation obtains a vastly increased citizen income i repeat that if this citizen income can be raised to eighty billion dollars a year the national government and the overwhelming majority of state and local governments will be definitely out of the red the higher the national income goes the faster will we be able to reduce the total of federal and state and local debts viewed from every angle today's purchasing power the citizens income of today is not at this time sufficient to drive the economic system of america to higher speed responsibility of government requires us at this time to supplement the normal processes and in so supplementing them to make sure that the addition is adequate we must start again on a long steady upward incline in national income and in that process which i believe is ready to start 
let us avoid the pitfalls of the past the overproduction the overspeculation and indeed all the extremes which we did not succeed in avoiding in nineteen twenty nine in all of this the government cannot and should not act alone business must help and i am sure business will help we need more than the materials of recovery we need a united national will we need to recognize nationally that the demands of no group however just can be satisfied unless that group is prepared to share in finding a way to produce the income from which they and all other groups can be paid you as the congress i as the president must by virtue of our offices seek the national good by preserving the balance between all groups and all sections we have at our disposal the national resources the money the skill of hand and head to raise our economic level our citizens income our capacity is limited only by our ability to work together what is needed is the will the time has come to bring that will into action with every driving force at our command and i am determined to do my share certain positive requirements seem to me to accompany the will if we have that will there is placed on all of us the duty of self-restraint that is the discipline of a democracy every patriotic citizen must say to himself or herself that immoderate statements appeals to prejudice the creation of unkindness are offenses not against an individual or individuals but offenses against the whole population of the united states self-restraint implies restraint by articulate public opinion trained to distinguish fact from falsehood trained to believe that bitterness is never a useful instrument in public affairs there can be no dictatorship by an individual or by a group in this nation save through division fostered by hate such division there must never be and finally i should like to say a personal word to you i never forget that i live in a house owned by all the american people and that i have been given their trust i try always to remember that their deepest problems are human i constantly talk with those who come to tell me their own points of view with those who manage the great industries and financial institutions of the country with those who represent the farmer and the worker and often with average citizens without high position who come to this house and constantly i seek to look beyond the doors of the white house beyond the officialdom of the national capital into the hopes and fears of men and women in their homes i have traveled the country over many times my friends my enemies my daily mail bring me reports of what you are thinking and hoping i want to be sure that neither battles nor burdens of office shall ever blind me to an intimate knowledge of the way the american people want to live and the simple purposes for which they put me here in these great problems of government i try not to forget that what really counts at the bottom of it all is that the men and women willing to work can have a decent job to take care of themselves and their homes and their children adequately that the farmer the factory worker the storekeeper the gas station man the manufacturer the merchant big or small the banker who takes pride in the help that he can give to the building of his community that all of these can be sure of a reasonable profit and safety for the savings they earn not today nor tomorrow alone but as far ahead as they can see i can hear your unspoken wonder as to where we are headed in this troubled world i cannot expect all of the people to understand all of the people's problems but it is my job to try to understand those problems i always try to remember that reconciling differences cannot satisfy everyone completely because i do not expect too much i am not disappointed but i know that i must never give up that i must never let the greater interest of all the people down merely because that might be for the moment the easiest personal way out 
I believe that we have been right in the course that we have charted. To abandon our purpose of building a greater, more stable, and more tolerant America would be to miss the tide, and perhaps to miss the port. I propose to sail ahead. I feel sure that your hopes and your help are with me. For to reach a port we must sail. Sail, not lie at anchor. Sail, not drift. End of section 13. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 14 of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. The Fireside Chat saw Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt, Section 14, June 24, 1938. Our government, happily, is a democracy. As part of the democratic process, your president is again taking an opportunity to report on the progress of national affairs to report to the real rulers of this country, the voting public. The 75th Congress elected in November 1936 on a platform uncompromisingly liberal has adjourned. Barring unforeseen events, there will be no session until a new Congress to be elected in November assembles next January. On the one hand, the 75th Congress has left many things undone. For example, it refused to provide more business-like machinery for running the executive branch of the government. The Congress also failed to meet my suggestion that it take the far-reaching steps necessary to put the railroads of the country back on their feet. But on the other hand, the Congress, striving to carry out the platform on which most of its members were elected, achieved more for the good of the country than any Congress did between the end of the World War and the spring of 1933. I mention tonight only the more important of these achievements. 1. It improved still further our agricultural laws to give the farmer a fair share of the national income, to preserve our soil, to provide an all-weather granary, to help the farm tenant towards independence, to find new uses for farm products, and to begin crop insurance. 2. After many requests on my part, the Congress passed a Fair Labor Standards Act commonly called the Wages and Hours Bill. That act, applying to products in interstate commerce, ends child labor, sets a floor below wages, and a ceiling over hours of labor. Except perhaps for the Social Security Act, it is the most far-reaching, the most far-sighted program for the benefit of workers ever adopted here or in any other country. Without question, it starts us toward a better standard of living and increases purchasing power to buy the products of farm and factory. Do not let any calamity howling executive with an income of a thousand dollars a day who has been turning his employees over to the government relief rolls in order to preserve his company's undistributed reserves tell you using his stockholders' money to pay the postage for his personal opinions, that a wage of $11 a week is going to have a disastrous effect on all American industry. Fortunately for business as a whole, and therefore for the nation, that type of executive is a rarity with whom most business executives most heartily disagree. 3. The Congress has provided a fact-finding commission to find a path through the jungle of contradictory theories about the wise business practices, to find the necessary facts for any intelligent legislation on monopoly, on price-fixing, and on the relationship between big business and medium-sized business and little business. Different from a great part of the world, we in America persist in our belief in individual enterprise and in the profit motive but we realize we must continually seek improved practices to ensure the continuance of reasonable profits together with scientific progress 
individual initiative, opportunities for the little fellow, fair prices, decent wages, and continuing employment. 4. The Congress has coordinated the supervision of commercial aviation and air mail by establishing a new Civil Aeronautics Authority, and it has placed all postmasters under the civil service for the first time in our national history. 5. The Congress set up the United States Housing Authority to help finance large-scale slum clearance and provide low-rent housing for the low-income groups in our cities. And by improving the Federal Housing Act, the Congress made it easier for private capital to build modest homes and low-rental dwellings. 6. The Congress has properly reduced taxes on small corporate enterprises and has made it easier for the Reconstruction Finance Corporation to make credit available to all business. I think the bankers of the country can fairly be expected to participate in loans where the government, through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, offers to take a fair portion of the risk. 7. The Congress has provided additional funds for the Works Progress Administration, the Public Works Administration, the Rural Electrification Administration, the Civilian Conservation Corps, and other agencies in order to take care of what we hope is a temporary additional number of unemployed at this time and to encourage production of every kind by private enterprise. All these things together I call our program for the national defense of our economic system. It is a program of balanced action, of moving on all fronts at once, in intelligent recognition that all of our economic problems of every group and of every section of the country are essentially one problem. 8. Finally, because of increasing armaments in other nations and an international situation which is definitely disturbing to all of us, the Congress has authorized important additions to the national armed defense of our shores and our people. On another important subject, the net result of a struggle in the Congress has been an important victory for the people of the United States, what might well be called a lost battle which won a war. You will remember that on February 5, 1937, I sent a message to the Congress dealing with the real need of federal court reforms of several kinds. In one way or another, during the sessions of this Congress, the ends, the real objectives, sought in that message have been substantially obtained. The attitude of the Supreme Court towards constitutional questions is entirely changed. Its recent decisions are eloquent testimony of a willingness to collaborate with the two other branches of government to make democracy work. The government has been granted the right to protect its interest in litigation between private parties involving the constitutionality of federal and to appeal directly to the Supreme Court in all cases involving the constitutionality of federal statutes, and no single judge is any longer empowered to suspend a federal statute on his sole judgment as to its constitutionality. Justices of the Supreme Court may now retire at the age of 70, after 10 years of service. A substantial number of additional judgeships have been created in order to expedite the trial of cases, and finally, greater flexibility has been added to the federal judicial system by allowing judges to be assigned to congested districts. Another indirect accomplishment of this Congress has been its response to the devotion of the American people to a course of sane and consistent liberalism. The Congress has understood that under modern conditions, government has a continuing responsibility to meet continuing problems, and that government cannot take a holiday of a year or a month or even a day just because a few people are tired or frightened by the inescapable pace, fast pace, of this modern world 
in which we live. Some of my opponents and some of my associates have considered that I have a mistakenly sentimental judgment as to the tenacity of purpose and the general level of intelligence of the American people. I am still convinced that the American people, since 1932, continue to insist on two requisites of private enterprise and the relationship of government to it. The first is a complete honesty at the top in looking after the use of other people's money and in appropriating and paying individual and corporate taxes according to ability to pay. The second is sincere respect for the need of all people who are at the bottom, all people at the bottom who need to get work, and through work to get a really fair share of the good things of life, and a chance to save and rise. After the election of 1936, I was told, and the Congress was told, by an increasing number of politically and worldly wise people, that I should coast along, enjoy an easy presidency for four years, and not take the democratic platform too seriously. They told me that people were getting weary of reform through political effort and would no longer oppose that small minority which, in spite of its own disastrous leadership in 1929, is always eager to resume its control over the government of the United States. Never in our lifetime has such a concerted campaign of defeatism been thrown at the heads of the President and the Senators and Congressmen, as in the case of this 75th Congress. Never before have we had so many Copperheads, and you will remember that it was the Copperheads who, in the days of the war between the states, tried their best to make President Lincoln and his Congress give up the fight. Let the nation remain split in two, and return to peace, peace at any price. This Congress has ended on the side of the people. My faith in the American people, and their faith in themselves, have been justified. I congratulate the Congress and the leadership thereof, and I congratulate the American people on their own staying power. One word about our economic situation. It makes no difference to me whether you call it a recession or a depression. In 1932, the total national income of all the people in the country had reached the low point of $38 billion in that year. With each succeeding year, it rose. Last year, 1937, it had risen to $70 billion, despite definitely worse business and agricultural prices in the last four months of last year. This year, 1938, while it is too early to do more than give an estimate, we hope that the national income will not fall below $60 billion. We remember also that banking and business and farming are not falling apart, like the one Hoss Shea, as they did in the terrible winter of 1932-1933. Last year, mistakes were made by the leaders of private enterprise, by the leaders of labor, and by the leaders of government, all three. Last year, the leaders of private enterprise pleaded for a sudden curtailment of public spending, and said they would take up the slack. But they made the mistake of increasing their inventories too fast, and setting many of their prices too high for their goods to sell. Some labor leaders goaded by decades of oppression of labor, made the mistake of going too far. They were not wise in using methods which frightened many well-wishing people. They asked employers not to bargain with them, but to put up with jurisdictional disputes at the same time. Government, too, made mistakes. Mistakes of optimism in assuming that industry and labor would themselves make no mistakes. The government made a mistake of timing in not passing a farm bill or a wage and hour bill last year. As a result of the lessons of these mistakes, we hope that in the future, private enterprise, capital and labor alike, will operate more intelligently together and operate in greater cooperation with their own government than they have in the past. Such cooperation on the part of both of them 
will be very welcome to me. Certainly, at this stage, there should be a united stand on the part of both of them to resist wage cuts, which would further reduce purchasing power. Today, a great steel company announced a reduction in prices with a view to stimulating business recovery, and I was gratified to know that this reduction involved no wage cut. Every encouragement ought to be given to industry, which accepts the large volume and high-wage policy. If this is done, it ought to result in conditions which will replace a great part of the government spending, which the failure of cooperation has made necessary this year. From March 4, 1933, down, not a single week has passed without a cry from the opposition, a small opposition, a cry to do something, to say something, to restore confidence. There is a very articulate group of people in this country with plenty of ability to procure publicity for their views, who have consistently refused to cooperate with the mass of the people, whether things were going well or going badly, on the ground that they required more concessions to their point of view before they would admit having what they called confidence. These people demanded restoration of confidence when the banks were closed, and demanded it again when the banks were reopened. They demanded restoration of confidence when hungry people were thronging the streets, and again when the hungry people were fed and put to work. They demanded restoration of confidence when droughts hit the country, and again now when our fields are laden with bounteous yields and excessive crops. They demanded restoration of confidence last year when the automobile industry was running three shifts and turning out more cars than the country could buy, and again this year when the industry is trying to get rid of an automobile surplus and has shut down its factories as a result. It is my belief that many of these people who have been crying aloud for confidence are beginning today to realize that that hand has been overplayed and that they are now willing to talk cooperation instead. It is my belief that the mass of the American people do have confidence in themselves, have confidence in their ability, with the aid of government, to solve their own problems. It is because you are not satisfied, and I am not satisfied, with the progress that we have made in finally solving our business and agricultural and social problems, but I believe the great majority of you want your own government to keep on trying to solve them. In simple frankness and in simple honesty, I need all the help I can get. And I see signs of getting more help in the future from many who have fought against progress with tooth and nail. And now, following out this line of thought, I want to say a few words about the coming political primaries. Fifty years ago, party nominations were generally made in conventions a system typified in the public imagination by a little group in a smoke-filled room who made out the party slates. The direct primary was invented to make the nominating process a more democratic one, to give the party voters themselves a chance to pick their party candidates. What I am going to say to you tonight does not relate to the primaries of any particular political party, but to matters of principle in all parties, Democrat, Republican, farm labor, progressive, socialist, or any other, let that be clearly understood. It is my hope that everybody affiliated with any party will vote in the primaries, and that every such voter will consider the fundamental principles for which his or her party is on record. That makes for a healthy choice between the candidates of the opposing parties on Election Day in November. An election cannot give the country a firm sense of direction if it has two or more national parties, which merely have different names, but are as alike as their principles and aims as peas in the same pod. In the coming primaries, in all parties, there will be many clashes between two schools of thought, generally classified as liberal and conservative. Roughly speaking, the liberal school of thought recognizes that the new conditions throughout the world call for new remedies. Those of us in America, 
who hold to this school of thought insist that these new remedies can be adopted and successfully maintained in this country under our present form of government if we use government as an instrument of cooperation to provide these remedies we believe that we can solve our problems through continuing effort through democratic processes instead of fascism or communism we are opposed to the kind of moratorium on reform which in effect is reaction itself be it clearly understood however that when i use the word liberal i mean the believer in progressive principles of democratic representative government and not the wild man who in effect leans in the direction of communism for that is just as dangerous as fascism itself the opposing or conservative school of thought as a general proposition does not recognize the need for government itself to step in and take action to meet these new problems it believes that individual initiative and private philanthropy will solve them that we ought to repeal many of the things we have done and go back for instance to the old gold standard or stop all this business of old age pensions and unemployment insurance or repeal the securities and exchange act or let monopolies thrive unchecked return in effect to the kind of government that we had in the twenties assuming the mental capacity of all the candidates the important question which it seems to me the primary voter must ask is this to which of these general schools of thought does the candidate belong as president of the united states i'm not asking the voters of the country to vote for democrats next november as opposed to republicans or members of any other party nor am i as president taking part in democratic primaries as the head of the democratic party however charged with the responsibility of carrying out the definitely liberal declaration of principles set forth in the nineteen thirty six democratic platform i feel that i have every right to speak in those few instances where there may be a clear-cut issue between candidates for a democratic nomination involving these principles or involving a clear misuse of my own name do not misunderstand me i certainly would not indicate a preference in a state primary merely because a candidate otherwise liberal in outlook had conscientiously differed with me on any single issue i should be far more concerned about the general attitude of a candidate towards present-day problems and his own inward desire to get practical needs attended to in a practical way we all know that progress may be blocked by outspoken reactionaries and also by those who say yes to a progressive objective but who always find some reason to oppose any special specific proposal to gain that objective i call that type of candidate a yes but fellow and i am concerned about the attitude of a candidate or his sponsors with respect to the rights of american citizens to assemble peaceably and to express publicly their views and opinions on important social and economic issues there can be no constitutional democracy in any community which denies to the individual his freedom to speak and worship as he wishes the american people will not be deceived by anyone who attempts to suppress individual liberty under the pretense of patriotism this being a free country with freedom of expression especially with freedom of the press there will be a lot of mean blows struck between now and election day by blows i mean misrepresentation personal attack and appeals to prejudice it would be a lot better of course if campaigns everywhere could be waged with arguments instead of with blows I hope the liberal candidates will confine themselves to argument and not resort to blows. In nine cases out of ten, the speaker or the writer who, seeking to influence public opinion, descends from calm argument to unfair blows, hurts himself more than his opponent. The Chinese have a story on this, a story based on three or four thousand years of civilization. Two Chinese coolies were arguing heatedly in the midst of the crowd. A stranger expressed surprise, but no blows were being struck. His Chinese friend replied, 
the man who strikes first admits that his ideas have given out i know that neither in the summer primaries nor in the november elections will the american voters fail to spot the candidate whose ideas have given out end of section fourteen Section 15 of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt. September 3, 1939. My fellow Americans and my friends, Tonight my single duty is to speak to the whole of America. Until 4.30 this morning I had hoped against hope that some miracle would prevent a devastating war in Europe and bring to an end the invasion of Poland by Germany. For four long years a succession of actual wars and constant crises have shaken the entire world and have threatened in each case to bring on the gigantic conflict which is today unhappily a fact. It is right that I should recall to your minds the consistent and at times successful efforts of your government in these crises to throw the full weight of the United States into the cause of peace. In spite of spreading wars, I think that we have every right and every reason to maintain as a national policy the fundamental moralities, the teachings of religion, and the continuation of efforts to restore peace. For some day, though the time may be distant, we can be of even greater help to a crippled humanity. It is right, too, to point out that the unfortunate events of these recent years have, without question, been based on the use of force and the threat of force. And it seems to me clear, even at the outbreak of this great war, that the influence of America should be consistent in seeking for humanity a final peace which will eliminate, as far as it is possible to do so, the continued use of force between nations. It is, of course, impossible to predict the future. I have my constant stream of information from American representatives and other sources throughout the world. You, the people of this country, are receiving news through your radios and your newspapers at every hour of the day. You are, I believe, the most enlightened and the best informed people in all the world at this moment. You are subjected to no censorship of news, and I want to add that your government has no information which it withholds, or which it has any thought of withholding from you. At the same time, as I told my press conference on Friday, it is of the highest importance that the press and the radio use the utmost caution to discriminate between actual verified fact on the one hand and mere rumor on the other. I can add to that by saying that I hope the people of this country will also discriminate most carefully between news and rumor. Do not believe of necessity everything you hear or read. Check up on it first. You must master at the outset a simple but unalterable fact in modern foreign relations between nations. When peace has been broken anywhere, the peace of all countries everywhere is in danger. It is easy for you and for me to shrug our shoulders and to say that conflicts taking place thousands of miles from the continental United States, and indeed thousands of miles from the whole American hemisphere, do not seriously affect the Americas, and that all the United States has to do is to ignore them and go about its own business. Passionately though we may desire detachment, we are forced to realize that every word that comes through the air, every ship that sails the sea, every battle that is fought, does affect the American future. Let no man or woman thoughtlessly or falsely talk of America sending its armies to European fields. At this moment there is being prepared a proclamation of American neutrality. This would have been done 
even if there had been no neutrality statute on the books for this proclamation is in accordance with international law and in accordance with american policy this will be followed by a proclamation required by the existing neutrality act and i trust that in the days to come our neutrality can be made a true neutrality it is of the utmost importance that the people of this country with the best information in the world think things through the most dangerous enemies of american peace are those who without well-rounded information on the whole broad subject of the past the present and the future undertake to speak with assumed authority to talk in terms of glittering generalities to give to the nation assurances or prophecies which are of little present or future value i myself cannot and do not prophesy the course of events abroad and the reason is that because i have of necessity such a complete picture of what is going on in every part of the world that i do not dare to do so and the other reason is that i think it is honest for me to be honest with the people of the united states i cannot prophesy the immediate economic effect of this new war on our nation but i do say that no american has the moral right to profiteer at the expense either of his fellow citizens or of the men the women and the children who are living and dying in the midst of war in europe some things we do know most of us in the united states believe in spiritual values most of us regardless of what church we belong to believe in the spirit of the new testament a great teaching which opposes itself to the use of force of armed force of marching armies and falling bombs the overwhelming masses of our people seek peace peace at home and the kind of peace in other lands which will not jeopardize our peace at home we have certain ideas and certain ideals of national safety and we must act to preserve that safety today and to preserve the safety of our children in future years that safety is and will be bound up with the safety of the western hemisphere and of the seas adjacent thereto we seek to keep war from our own firesides by keeping war from coming to the americas for that we have historic precedent that goes back to the days of the administration of president george washington it is serious enough and tragic enough to every american family in every state of the union to live in a world that is torn by wars on other continents those wars today affect every american home it is our national duty to use every effort to keep them out of the americas and at this time let me make the simple plea that partisanship and selfishness be adjourned and that national unity be the thought that underlies all others this nation will remain a neutral nation but i cannot ask that every american remain neutral in thought as well even a neutral has the right to take account of facts even a neutral cannot be asked to close his mind or his conscience i have said not once but many times that i have seen war and that i hate war i say that again and again i hope the united states will keep out of this war i believe that it will and i give you assurance and reassurance that every effort of your government will be directed toward that end as long as it remains within my power to prevent there will be no blackout of peace in the united states end of section 15 Section 16 of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt. May 26, 1940. Part one. My friends, at this moment of sadness throughout most of the world, 
I want to talk with you about a number of subjects that directly affect the future of the United States. We are shocked by the almost incredible eyewitness stories that come to us, stories of what is happening at this moment to the civilian populations of Norway and Holland and Belgium and Luxembourg and France. I think it is right on this Sabbath evening that I should say a word in behalf of women and children and old men who need help, immediate help in their present distress, help from us across the seas, help from us who are still free to give it. Tonight, over the once peaceful roads of Belgium and France, millions are now moving, running from their homes to escape bombs and shells and fire and machine gunning, without shelter and almost wholly without food. They stumble on, knowing not where the end of the road will be. I speak to you of these people because each one of you that is listening to me tonight has a way of helping them. The American Red Cross, that represents each of us, is rushing food and clothing and medical supplies to these destitute civilian millions. Please, I beg you, please give according to your means to your nearest Red Cross chapter. Give as generously as you can. I ask this in the name of our common humanity. Let us sit down together again, you and I, to consider our own pressing problems that confront us. There are many among us who in the past closed their eyes to events abroad, because they believed in utter good faith what some of their fellow Americans told them, that what was taking place in Europe was none of our business, that no matter what happened over there, the United States could always pursue its peaceful and unique course in the world. There are many among us who closed their eyes, from lack of interest or lack of knowledge, honestly and sincerely thinking that the many hundreds of miles of salt water made the American hemisphere so remote that the people of North and Central and South America could go on living in the midst of their vast resources without reference to or danger from other continents of the world. There are some among us who were persuaded by minority groups that we could maintain our physical safety by retiring within our continental boundaries, the Atlantic on the east, the Pacific on the west, Canada on the north, and Mexico on the south. I illustrated the futility, the impossibility of that idea in my message to the Congress last week. Obviously, a defense policy based on that is merely to invite future attack. And finally, there are a few among us who have deliberately and consciously closed their eyes because they were determined to be opposed to their government, its foreign policy, and every other policy, to be partisan, and to believe that anything that the government did was wholly wrong. To those who have closed their eyes for any of these many reasons, to those who would not admit the possibility of the approaching storm, to all of them the past two weeks have meant the shattering of many illusions. They have lost the illusion that we are remote and isolated, and therefore secure against the dangers from which no other land is free. In some quarters, with this rude awakening has come fear, fear bordering on panic. It is said that we are defenseless. It is whispered by some that only by abandoning our freedom, our ideals, our way of life, can we build our defenses adequately, can we match the strength of the aggressors. I did not share those illusions. I do not share these fears. Today we are now more realistic. But let us not be calamity howlers and discount our strength. Let us have done with both fears and illusions. On this Sabbath evening, in our homes in the midst of our American families, let us calmly consider what we have done and what we must do. In the past two or three weeks, all kinds of stories have been handed out to the American public about our lack of preparedness. It has even been charged that the money we have spent on our military and naval forces during the last few years has gone down the rat hole. 
I think that it is a matter of fairness to the nation that you hear the facts. Yes, we have spent large sums of money on the national defense. This money has been used to make our Army and Navy today the largest, the best equipped, and the best trained peacetime military establishment in the whole history of this country. Let me tell you just a few of the many things accomplished during the past few years. I do not propose to go into every detail. It is a known fact, however, that in 1933, when this administration came into office, the United States Navy had fallen in standing among the navies of the world, in power of ships and in efficiency, to a relatively low ebb. The relative fighting power on the Navy had been greatly diminished by failure to replace ships and equipment, which had become out of date. But between 1933 and this year, 1940, seven fiscal years, your government will have spent $1,487,000,000 more than it spent on the Navy during the seven years that preceded 1933. What did we get for this money? The fighting personnel of the Navy rose from 79,000 to 145,000. During this period, 215 ships for the fighting fleet have been laid down or commissioned, practically seven times the number in the preceding seven-year period. Of these 215 ships we have commissioned, 12 cruisers, 63 destroyers, 26 submarines, three aircraft carriers, two gunboats, seven auxiliaries, and many smaller craft. And among the many ships now being built and paid for as we build them are eight new battleships. Ship construction, of course, costs millions of dollars, more in the United States than anywhere else in the world. But it is a fact that we cannot have adequate Navy defense for all American waters without ships ships that sail the surface of the ocean, ships that move under the surface, and ships that move through the air. And, speaking of airplanes that work with the Navy, in 1933 we had 1,127 useful aircraft, and today we have 2,892 on hand and on order. Nearly all of the old planes of 1933 have been replaced by new planes, because they became obsolete or worn out. The Navy is far stronger today than any peacetime period in the whole long history of the nation. In hitting power and in efficiency, I would even make the assertion that it is stronger today than it was during the World War. The Army of the United States In 1933, it consisted of 122,000 enlisted men. Now, in 1940, that number has been practically doubled. The Army of 1933 had been given few new implements of war since 1919, and had been compelled to draw on old reserve stocks left over from the World War. The net result of all this was that our Army by 1933 had very greatly declined in its ratio of strength with the armies of Europe and of the Far East. That was the situation I found. But since then, great changes have taken place. Between 1933 and 1940, these past seven fiscal years, your government will have spent $1,292,000,000 more than it spent on the Army the previous seven years. What did we get for this money? The personnel of the Army, as I have said, has been almost doubled, and by the end of this year every existing unit of the present regular Army will be equipped with its complete requirements of modern weapons. Existing units of the National Guard will also be largely equipped with similar items. Here are some striking examples taken from a large number. Since 1933, we have actually purchased 5,640 airplanes including the most modern type of long-range bombers and fast-pursuit planes, though, of course, many of these which were delivered four, five, six, or seven years ago have worn out through use and been scrapped. 
We must remember that these planes cost money, a lot of it. For example, one modern four-engine long-range bombing plane costs $350,000. One modern interceptor pursuit plane cost $133,000. One medium bomber cost $160,000. In 1933, we had only 355 anti-aircraft guns. We now have more than 1,700 modern anti-craft guns of all types on hand or on order. And you ought to know that a 3-inch anti-aircraft gun cost $40,000 without any of the fire control equipment that goes with it. In 1933, there were only 24 modern infantry mortars in the entire Army. We now have on hand and on order more than 1,600. In 1933, we had only 48 modern tanks and armored cars. Today, we have on hand and on order 1,700. In each of our modern tanks cost $46,000. There are many other items in which our progress since 1933 has been rapid, and the great proportion of this advance consists of really modern equipment. In 1933, on the personnel side, we had 1,263 Army pilots. Today, the Army alone has more than 3,000 of the best fighting flyers in the world, flyers who last year flew more than one million hours in combat training. That figure does not include the hundreds of splendid pilots in the National Guard and in the organized reserves. Within the past year, the productive capacity of the aviation industry to produce military planes has been tremendously increased. In the past year, the capacity more than doubled, but that capacity is still inadequate. However, the government, working with industry, is determined to increase that capacity to meet our needs. We intend to harness the efficient machinery of these manufacturers to the government's program of being able to get 50,000 planes a year. One additional word about aircraft, about which we read so much. Recent wars, including the current war in Europe, have demonstrated beyond doubt that fighting efficiency depends on unity of command, unity of control. In sea operations, the airplane is just as much an integral part of the unity of operations as are the submarine, the destroyer, and the battleship. And in land warfare, the airplane is just as much a part of military operations as are the tank corps, the engineers, the artillery, or the infantry itself. Therefore, the air forces should continue to be part of the Army and Navy. In line with my request, the Congress, this week, is voting the largest appropriation ever asked by the Army or the Navy in peacetime, and the equipment and training provided for them will be in addition to the figures I have given you. The world situation may so change that it will be necessary to reappraise our program at any time. And in such case, I am confident that the Congress and Chief Executive will work in harmony as a team, as they are doing today. End of Section 16 Recording by Michael Fascio. Section 17 of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt May 26, 1940 Part 2 I will not hesitate at any moment to ask for additional funds when they are required. In this era of swift, mechanized warfare, we all have to remember that what is modern today and up-to-date, what is efficient and practical, becomes obsolete and outworn tomorrow. Even while the production line turns out airplanes, new airplanes are being designed on the drafting table. Even as a cruiser slides down the launching ways, plans for improvement, plans for increased efficiency in the next model, are taking shape in the blueprints of designers. Every day's fighting in Europe, on land, on sea, and in the air, discloses constant changes in methods of warfare. 
We are constantly improving and redesigning, testing new weapons, learning the lessons of the immediate war, and seeking to produce in accordance with the latest that the brains of science can conceive. We are calling upon the resources, the efficiency, and the ingenuity of the American manufacturers of war material of all kinds, airplanes and tanks and guns and ships, and all the hundreds of products that go into this material. The government of the United States itself manufactures few of the implements of war. Private industry will continue to be the source of most of this material, and private industry will have to be speeded up to produce it at the rate and efficiency called for by the needs of the times. I know that private business cannot be expected to make all of the capital investment required for expansions of plants and factories and personnel which this program calls for at once. It would be unfair to expect industrial corporations or their investors to do this, when there is a chance that a change in international affairs may stop or curtail future orders a year or two hence. Therefore, the government of the United States stands ready to advance the necessary money to help provide for the enlargement of factories, the establishment of new plants, the employment of thousands of necessary workers, the development of new sources of supply for the hundreds of raw materials required, the development of quick mass transportation of supplies. And the details of all of this are now being worked out in Washington, day and night. We are calling on men now engaged in private industry to help us in carrying out this program, and you will hear more of this in detail in the next few days. This does not mean that the men we call upon will be engaged in the actual production of this material. That will still have to be carried on in the plants and factories throughout the land. Private industry will have the responsibility of providing the best, speediest, and most efficient mass production of which it is capable. The functions of the businessmen, whose assistance we are calling upon, will be to coordinate this program, to see to it that all the plants continue to operate at maximum speed and efficiency. Patriotic Americans, of proven merit and of unquestioned ability in their special fields, are coming to Washington to help the government with their training, their experience, and their capability. It is our purpose not only to speed up production, but to increase the total facilities of the nation in such a way that they can be further enlarged to meet emergencies of the future. But as this program proceeds, there are several things we must continue to watch and safeguard things which are just as important to the sound defense of a nation as physical armament itself. While our Navy and our airplanes and our guns and our ships may be our first line of defense, it is still clear that way down at the bottom, underlying them all, giving them their strength, sustenance, and power, are the spirit and morale of a free people. For that reason, we must make sure, in all that we do, that there be no breakdown or cancellation of any of the great social gains which we have made in these past years. We have carried on an offensive on a broad front against social and economic inequalities and abuses which had made our society weak. That offensive should not now be broken down by the pincers movement of those who would use the present needs of physical military defense to destroy it. There is nothing in our present emergency to justify making the workers of our nation toil for longer hours than now limited by statute. As more orders come in, and as more work has to be done, tens of thousands of people, who are now unemployed, will, I believe, receive employment. There is nothing in our present emergency to justify a lowering of the standards of employment. Minimum wages should not be reduced. It is my hope, indeed, that the new speed-up of production will cause many businesses which now pay below minimum standards to bring their wages up. There is nothing in our present emergency to justify a breaking down of old-age pensions or of unemployment insurance. 
I would rather see the systems extended to other groups who do not now enjoy them. There is nothing in our present emergency to justify a retreat from any of our social objectives, from conservation of natural resources, assistance to agriculture, housing, and help to the underprivileged. Conversely, however, I am sure that responsible leaders will not permit some specialized group, which represents a minority of the total employees of a plant or an industry, to break up the continuity of employment of the majority of employees. Let us remember that the policy and the laws that provide for collective bargaining are still in force. I can assure you that labor will be adequately represented in Washington in the carrying out of this program of defense. Also, our present emergency and a common sense of decency make it imperative that no new group of war millionaires shall come into being in this nation as a result of the struggles abroad. The American people will not relish the idea of any American citizen growing rich and fat in an emergency of blood and slaughter and human suffering. And, last of all, this emergency demands that the consumers of America be protected so that our general cost of living can be maintained at a reasonable level. We ought to avoid the spiral processes of the World War, the rising spiral of costs of all kinds. The soundest policy is for every employer in the country to help give useful employment to the millions who are unemployed. By giving to those millions an increased purchasing power, the prosperity of the whole nation will rise to a much higher level. Today's threat to our national security is not a matter of military weapons alone. We know of new methods of attack. The Trojan Horse, the fifth column that betrays a nation unprepared for treachery. Spies, saboteurs, and traitors are the actors in this new strategy. With all of these we must and will deal vigorously. But there is an added technique for weakening a nation at its very roots, for disrupting the entire pattern of life of a people. And it is important that we understand it. The method is simple. It is, first, a dissemination of discord. A group, not too large, a group that may be sectional or racial or political, is encouraged to exploit its prejudices through false slogans and emotional appeals. The aim of those who deliberately egg on these groups is to create confusion of counsel, public indecision, political paralysis, and, eventually, a state of panic. Sound national policies come to be viewed with a new and unreasoning skepticism, not through the wholesome political debates of honest and free men, but through the clever schemes of foreign agents. As a result of these new techniques, armament programs may be dangerously delayed. Singleness of national purpose may be undermined. Men can lose confidences in each other, and therefore lose confidence in the efficacy of their own united action. Faith and courage can yield to doubt and fear. The unity of the state can be so sapped that its strength is destroyed. All this is no idle dream. It has happened time after time, in nation after nation, during the last two years. Fortunately, American men and women are not easy dupes. Campaigns of group hatred or class struggle have never made much headway among us, and are not making headway now. But new forces are being unleashed, deliberately planned propaganda to divide and weaken us in the face of danger as other nations have been weakened before. These dividing forces are undiluted poison. They must not be allowed to spread in the new world as they have in the old. Our morale and our mental defenses must be raised up as never before against those who would cast a smokescreen across our vision. The development of our defense program makes it essential that each and every one of us, men and women, feel that we have some contribution to make towards the security of our nation. At this time, when the world, and the world includes our own American hemisphere, 
when the world is threatened by forces of destruction, it is my resolve and yours to build up our armed defenses. We shall build them to whatever heights the future may require. We shall rebuild them swiftly, as the methods of warfare swiftly change. For more than three centuries, we Americans have been building on this continent a free society, a society in which the promise of the human spirit may find fulfillment. Commingled here are the blood and genius of all the peoples of the world who have sought this promise. We have built well. We are continuing our efforts to bring the blessings of a free society, of a free and productive economic system, to every family in the land. This is the promise of America. It is this that we must continue to build, this that we must continue to defend. It is the task of our generation, yours and mine. But we build and defend not for our generation alone. We defend the foundations laid down by our fathers. We build a life for generations yet unborn. We defend and we build a way of life, not for America alone, but for all mankind. Ours is a high duty, a noble task. Day and night I pray for the restoration of peace in this mad world of ours. It is not necessary that I, the President asked the American people to pray in behalf of such a cause, for I know you are praying with me. I am certain that out of the hearts of every man, woman, and child in this land, in every waking minute, a supplication goes up to Almighty God, that all of us beg that suffering and starving, that death and destruction may end, and that peace may return to the world. In common affection for all mankind, your prayers join with mine, that God will heal the wounds and the hearts of humanity. End of section 17